For an NBC News special report as we bring you the fifth public hearing of the January 6th committee from Washington, D.C., we know three former senior DOJ officials, including the former acting attorney general, Jeffrey Rosen, are all scheduled to testify today. All three of them met with the former president, Donald Trump, in the Oval Office on January 3rd. NBC Nightly News anchor Lester Holt picks up our coverage right now. This is an NBC News special report. The results of a year-long investigation into the January 6th attack. Day five of the unprecedented congressional hearings. Today, testimony from Justice Department officials whom President Trump tried to force out over his false election fraud claims. He's become detached from reality if he really believes this stuff. As the committee tries to prove that the former president was responsible for the assault on the Capitol. President Trump summoned the mob, assembled the mob, and lit the flame of this attack. New evidence set to be revealed today as the January 6th committee makes its case to the American people. Here now is Lester Holt. Good day, everyone. Did former President Trump pressure the nation's top law enforcement agency to help overturn the 2020 election? That's the focus of today's hearing of the January 6th committee. Out of the microscope, the Department of Justice and whether Donald Trump, along with a high-ranking DOJ member, plotted to get some states to decertify votes. We'll hear testimony about that and a potential scheme to shake up staffing within the department in order to advance Trump's fraudulent claims about winning the election. And just when we thought the committee would be wrapping up these hearings in a matter of days, a stunning development with so much new information being uncovered, the committee chairman says he's pressing pause, delaying the next two hearings until sometime next month. Why? It's to sift through what one panel member calls a mountain of new information centered on how the former president directed protesters toward the Capitol on January 6th and failed to control the violent mob. We'll be discussing that new evidence, which includes never-before-seen film footage of interviews with the first family and Vice President Pence. We'll tell you where it came from and what it could mean for building a case against the former president. We'll get to all that, but first we focus on what lies ahead today, and that's a lot. We begin with NBC News senior Capitol Hill correspondent Garrett Haig. Garrett, Tuesday's testimony focused on how election officials were harassed and even threatened in some states. Tell us more about what to expect as the focus now shifts to the Department of Justice. Lester, today's hearing will have two main thrusts along that point. The first will be the effort by the Trump administration, the committee will claim, to pressure top DOJ leaders to come up with an investigation, or at least look like they were conducting an investigation, into the claims of voter fraud that Trump had been making around the country. This hearing will be quarterbacked, if you will, by Republican Adam Kinzinger, and I had a chance to discuss with him yesterday how he sees this portion of their case shaping up. Here's what he told me. So is it fair to say that the president was trying to like use the DOJ's credibility against the election results? I, I think that's very fair to say. I think it's fair to say that the president really wanted the stamp of doubt that comes with the DOJ seal. So if part one of this hearing, then, is the focus on getting the DOJ to open up investigation or investigations into these claims of voter fraud, part two is what happens after our witnesses today, three top former DOJ officials, refuse to do so. And that is, the committee will outline, an effort to replace the head of the DOJ with a more compliant figure, a man named Jeff Clark, who was an environmental lawyer and who uh, the committee believes there was a full-fledged scheme to have take control of the DOJ. Instead, there was was something of a revolt among top DOJ officials and staffers saying they would not serve under Clark. And so that portion of the president's plan was never put into action. But that is what the committee intends to lay out today in broad strokes, Lester. All right, Garrett, thank you. Joining me here now, my colleagues Hallie Jackson, our senior Washington correspondent, and Chuck Todd, NBC's political director and moderator of Meet the Press. Thanks for both being here. Chuck, start us off. What are you mm -hmm. looking for today? What's in important to key in on. Well, look, this is meddling at the Justice Department. And if we you know we talk about all the parallels to Watergate, this is probably the most direct mm. parallel to Watergate in the 
infamous Saturday Night Massacre, where then President Nixon essentially wanted he wanted the special he wanted the people investigating him fired, and he needed the an attorney general to be compliant. So obviously it was a different thing he was looking for. But this was a case where it looks like this is what Donald Trump's going to do. And, and there had been sort of look, there's no laws here that say a president. Can you know they they work for the president? He could have done this. He was within his constitutional rights. But there's been this accepted practice post Watergate that you don't meddle. Bill Clinton wanted to fire his special prosecutor a bunch of times, but he couldn't. He didn't politically. You wouldn't touch Janet Reno uh, at that time, and it didn't happen. So today, I think this is of how he tried to essentially use the government and the credibility of the Justice Department to give more credibility to these claims. I mean, you'll hear in some of these snippets, we've seen the reporting, he, he simply wanted the announcement. Give me the press release, I'll right. spin it. You know, I think it we'll was- We'll do a, the rest. We'll do yeah. the rest yeah. is, is what it was. So this, uh, I think the most shocking part of this scheme is that Donald Trump decided not to do it. And that's the part of this that I think has always been, and this is, for what it's worth, I think is sort of a, it makes it a little bit tougher to, to charge him with something over time. I think Mr. Clark's in a, in a lot more potential legal trouble than, than on this case than Mr. Trump because he didn't pull the trigger. But it does seem as if he was close. And when the more I've learned about this, the more I'm still personally surprised he didn't go through with it. Well, Hallie, this whole, the, all these hearings have really been a story of a president who was walking at least right up to the line. Yeah. And it's unclear in some of these cases whether he crossed it in, in a major kind of a way. What are you looking for here? I'm looking for that, Lester. Whether we, These are people who were in conversations with the president, and I imagine we'll hear about a couple of them end of December, again in early January, in the room with him, with in some cases his top White House counsel, Pat Cipollone, other people who were key to the president's inner circle at the time. At any point, did Donald Trump acknowledge to them that what he was doing, he knew would violate the law in the way that they were describing, right? So I think that's one of the key pieces we have to watch for here. I think when you look broadly at this, a, a lot of the conversations that we're going to hear have been reported, frankly, by our outlet, by The New York Times, The Washington Post, others, right? But what I think is going to be critical here is listening to the storyline as it weaves together. Think about, the, for lack of a better word, the characters that we're going to meet today. In some ways, this is a tale of two Jeffs. Jeff Jeffrey Clark and Jeffrey Rosen, right? Jeffrey Clark, this environmental lawyer, that was his background, who was introduced to the president, connected through the president, reportedly through a Republican member of Congress, who I think we'll hear more about and who we'll talk more about, um, who, who backed the president's lies of election fraud, essentially, was sympathetic to that, to the point where Jeffrey Clark even wrote a letter, a five-page letter, describing ways that he thought that Donald Trump could, in the state of Georgia, for example, push back against the legitimate election results. Jeffrey Rosen and the other witnesses we're going to hear from, Richard Donahue and Stephen Engel, they were pushing hard against the president the other way, right, involved in these meetings, saying, if you do this, if you put Jeffrey Clark in charge, we're out. We're done, we quit, right? And these people are interesting. We've talked a lot about Jeff Rosen, right? The one time acting attorney general who was only in that job for about a month after By Bill the way, Barr That resigned. is a mystery that I, we're not solving, but Bill Barr has never given us the full explanation of why he decided to quit early. I think we all have an idea. He didn't want to have to, he didn't want to have to tell the president no. And the but relationship he did, deteriorated the pretty bad. No. Well, he did, point. but he also decided well, we to told walk him the away. the votes weren't there, yeah. Right. He also decided to walk End away of December. Right. because he didn't want, he knew what could he might be asked to do next, and he didn't perhaps didn't want to be put in that position. It is still a the fact that Barr left uh, Jeffrey Rosen in this position has always been something that I think needs a little more a, a little more exploration than we've been able to get. So you have Rosen; he's going to be one of the live witnesses. You have a guy named Richard Donahue, who, by the way, we know took notes about some of these meetings, handwritten notes. That by the way, since most been lawyers released. you ever met a lawyer that doesn't take. I was going to say these typical British, fascinating yeah. notes, right? Because he's describing the things that Donald Trump was saying in these conversations. I'd be shocked if that doesn't come up in the hearing today. I think we can show you some of the notes he took, where he describes pieces of the conversation where the former president, Chuck, to your point, said. Exactly Exactly that. All I need is for you to, and I'm paraphrasing here, is to make the announcement. Republican congressman, he says, just say that the election was corrupt and leave the rest to me and the mm -hmm. Republican congressman, is what Donahue says the president says. Yeah, and then, he just wanted irregularities. Well, there were whatever. You know, he did anything out of the Justice Department's mouth. I'm also interested in Stephen Engel, who was the former assistant attorney general for the Office of Legal Counsel at the DOJ. 
not a household name. I think that's fair to say, right? Not somebody who is at the center of a lot of the discussion in the lead up to January 6th and in the months after. This is somebody who, though, was on, for example, the Supreme Court long list from President Trump at the time when he was in office back in September of 2020, in case there had been an opening, et cetera. Um, he is somebody who was a well-respected attorney who was also in these meetings. And that is interesting because there hasn't been a lot of public reporting about what he has had to say or what he saw and heard. So I think there's a lot of threads to pull on, but that's at least where I'm starting, Lester. All right, let me go to our Washington correspondent, Yamiche Alcindor. She's with us. Today's hearing might be the most impactful so far. Uh, why do you think that? Well, they might be the most impactful so far because you're going to hear directly from Department of Justice officials about their direct conversations with former President Trump. There's been a lot said of, of sort of what people might have heard or what people thought, but the fact that these are going to be the people who were in the room with the president. Um, we heard, of course, from people who had been on calls with the president, but he, these are going to be people who know firsthand just how far former President Trump was willing to go. And I think a lot of the issues that are at hand, you've talked about at the table, but there's also this key word of pardons. Representative Scott Perry and a number of Republican lawmakers um, were accused, and lawmakers say, of trying to seek pardons after January 6th, and even in some cases in the days before January 6th, because they were worried about the activities that they had taken part in. So I think it's going to be very interesting to learn, sort of, was there a pardon list? Did former President Trump talk about that? What role possibly could the Department of Justice had, have had in that? I also think, of course, Jeffrey Clark is going to be fan fascinating to hear about, because we heard, of course, about um, his involvement in the, in the five-page letter that he wrote, uh, a draft letter about what the DOJ could do um, and how it could possibly tell states not to continue counting votes or to possibly overturn the 2020 election. But also, Jeffrey Clark um, was someone who had this sort of really dramatic meeting in the Oval Office, where his bosses, one of them not even being able to wear a suit, he was out walking, as, as apparently, Richard Donahue, and had to run to the White House to try to convince former President Trump not to put Jeffrey Clark in charge. One other thing, the politics of this are going to be something that I'm going to be watching, because we know now that the Biden administration is under a lot of pressure to really put, be more aggressive, rather, with Merrick Garland, the attorney general, in trying to push him to prosecute more people in connection with the January 6th investigation. And there are some Democrats who have told me, frankly, they want the DOJ to be doing more. But the White House has said over and over again that they're not going to be pressured into doing what they think their predecessors did, which was treating the DOJ as their personal legal arm. Instead, President Biden has said, I'm going to be allow the DOJ to be very, very independent of me. I think that that's the politics of this is going to be really interesting to see because of the juxtaposition of these two administrations. All right. Yamish, thank you. I want to bring in our uh, NBC News legal analyst and criminal defense attorney, uh, Danny Savalas. Danny, uh, we have heard a lot about Bill Barr. He's had a lot of airtime, if you will, in these, in these hearings. We're going to talk about him probably again today. He has been kind of positioned as the guy that stood up early and said, Mr. President, these votes aren't here. These fraudulent votes aren't here. What should we know as we continue to watch him use in these hearings? For the last week, Bill Barr has gotten a kind of a pass. And it's probably because he may have the most memorable line to date in these proceedings. And I won't repeat it here, Lester, don't it worry. With a B, yeah. But yeah, it I starts mean. with a B, and it went around the world. And people saw that as Bill Barr standing up to Trump. And that is held for about a week. I think that's going to change today, and I'll tell you why. Because we are probably going to hear about things like a memorandum that Bill Barr issued that we reported on back when it came out that essentially said, look, if there's some real obvious uh, indications of election fraud, then you, DOJ, can investigate it, which many people in the DOJ, in the public integ integrity, they pushed back. People did not agree with this memorandum. Now, I think Bill Barr positions it in the very language of the memo as if he's slow walking, as if he's doing the bare minimum. Well, look, I probably shouldn't look into this, but I'll just issue a memo that says, hey, if you see something glaring, look into it, but otherwise, don't do much. In the Georgia situation with the suitcases of votes, conduct some interviews, talk to some people, and then do that, and then be done with it. So Bill Barr may position this as, hey, I just did the bare minimum. I wasn't really carrying out Trump's orders. But I think today, we're going to hear a slightly different story, and it will be really the ones who stood up are going to be folks like Rosen and Donnie, who apparently, according to the evidence, stood up the entire time, never gave an inch. And when it came to things like sending out letters about uh, canceling out electors, they said, heck no, we're not doing that. Uh, no chance. And to Chuck's point, the president didn't go through. He didn't go he through. He didn't it. go through it. So I, yeah. I, I wonder how much. Which, by the way, his alleys, 
his allies will say often, right? Yeah. I mean, that is something you hear from those close so, to him. So where does intent, if you're looking at this through a purely legal uh, a lens, where does intent play? In the law, we have a thing called inchoate or incomplete crimes. That's crimes like attempt or conspiracy, where the actual eventual crime may not even be carried out. But as a matter of public policy, we punish the effort to complete a crime just as much often as we do the completed crime itself. You don't want to reward people for being really lousy at committing crimes or maybe changing their mind at the very end. So uh, to me, what I'm going to be looking for is the requisite intent, not whether or not this was actually completed. The mere fact that Trump asks and is told it's wrong and then apparently asks again and again based on really nothing that we've seen other than, and I'm quoting some prior witnesses, theories and not evidence. I think that's going to be critical here. And there comes a point where intent is assumed if somebody continues on in the face of knowledge or information that what they are doing is wrong. And I think that's what uh, the committee's trying what, to build what, here. I, the, the I guess the question I have is, what, what did he do illegally in this situation? Because he had the authority to hire and fire everybody that was in that Oval Office with him. That's right. So that's the problem with this, is that it doesn't fit neatly into definitions of crimes. And it's really easy for someone like me to stand up here and look at the crimes code and say, oh, this could be conspiracy to defraud the United States, right? Or this could even just be uh, mail fraud because something went in the mail. But it's an entirely different thing where you have an totally unprecedented set of facts uh, and a totally unprecedented situation. I think this is quite different. It reminds us of the Saturday Night Massacre, yeah, but it is factually a lot different. I would argue that the efforts are even more documented and more severe than they were in the case of the Saturday Night Massacre. And of course, as you pointed out, you don't have DOJ uh, officials actually leaving. They're just threatening to leave. And you have this Jeffrey Clark uh, figure who's going to be like an Iago figure today, scheming behind the scenes to get the job and okay. going at some point uh, to Jeffrey Rosen and saying, uh, look, it's a real nice job you have at the DOJ. If you want to keep it, yeah. if you send out these letters, then maybe I don't want the job so much. Janie, do you think we'll have a better idea of why Barr left early? No, and I think that's something everybody wants to know. Why and why at that moment? Why so close to the end and why just essentially moments we before all, all these other things happen? We all want to spend more time with our family. Sure, we all want to spend more time with our family. That's a fine enough reason. But why not finish it out? Why leave when he did? Will we ever get an answer to when that? I don't think we knew what was happening. He knew the he entire knew time. He knew what was going to be. He had already dealt with some of it. I, I, I find this to be what it, there's a lot of un little unsolved side mysteries this is one that there's so, it, it it feels like I didn't get a I didn't feel like we got a great explanation even in this book well and I just remember I was I was covering the White House at the time and I was talking to people who were close to Bill Barr at the time when the rumor was the speculation was is he gonna leave is he gonna leave and these folks would tell me things like well he feels like he can do his job right now his relationship it was obviously deteriorating with Donald Trump at the time but Chuck you know this is a guy Lester you know you interviewed him he wrote a book about the experience he's talked extensively in multiple interviews about that experience and that is still one of those outstanding questions. Yeah, let me go to NBC News national security correspondent Ken Delaney, and he's live at the Justice Department. Ken, we're going to hear uh, a lot more about Jeffrey Clark today. Uh, we probably won't hear anything, though, about the visit that he received from uh, federal agents. That's right, Lester. You've been talking about how Jeffrey Clark and his activities will be, in many ways, the centerpiece of this hearing we're about to watch. Well, we learned a few hours ago that Jeffrey Clark's home was visited yesterday by a number of federal law enforcement agents. The government is being rather circumspect about what exactly happened. Uh, an official just said there was some law enforcement activity at Jeffrey Clark's Virginia home. But Jeffrey Clark's boss, who is a former Trump administration official, has said in a statement that this was essentially a pre-dawn raid by uh, a dozen federal agents who took Jeffrey Clark out of his home in his pajamas and seized his electronic devices. Now, if that characterization is correct, Lester, it suggests uh, these agents had obtained a search warrant, which means they convinced the judge that there was probable cause to believe that a crime was occurring. Now, often a search warrant in, in such cases would be served if they believe a subject is concealing evidence or destroying evidence that otherwise could have been obtained by a subpoena. And this is a huge development in, in this investigation investigation, this parallel investigation that is being run by the Justice Department out of that building behind me into um, what happened here in terms of efforts to overturn the election. Doubly significant because, um, as we're going to hear today, 
almost everything that Jeffrey Clark was doing and talking about in terms of scheming to overturn this election, he was discussing with the then president of the United States, Donald Trump. And uh, had he succeeded in some of these schemes, we, it could have been a much different result. One of the things he was trying to do is uh, get the Justice Department to send letters to various states saying that the Justice Department had found fraud in the election, when in fact the Justice Department had found no such thing. But had those letters gone out, it could have emboldened people who wanted to install false electors uh, and really change the game. So this was a very close call. We're going to hear today that these Trump-appointed Justice Department officials um, did the right thing when it mattered and said no to this stuff and threatened to resign. But the theory of the case was outlined by Liz Cheney when she gave their, her dramatic opening statement at the beginning of all these hearings, which is that there was a conspiracy here uh, that she argues is criminal. She used the word corrupt many times to overthrow the election, that whether they succeeded or not, does not matter that there, the conspiracy still existed and should be investigated. Ken, are, are the DOJ and the committee playing well together here? Well, there, there were some reports in recent days that, you know, the DOJ was asking for transcripts that the committee uh, of, of committee witness testimony that the committee did not want to hand over. But um, my understanding is that they are playing well together. There are a lot of federal prosecutors working for this, former federal prosecutors working for this January 6th committee, people who have worked in this building behind me, uh, who know how this works. Um, they they want to conduct a thorough investigation, but they don't appear to intend in any way to be hiding anything or keeping anything from the Justice Department. There are logistical issues, but those can be worked out. Ken, thanks very much. And, and Chuck, there seems to be one of the subplots is the press pressure on DOJ. As this stuff unfolds and people's jaws are dropping, yeah. they look to DOJ, well, what are you going to do about it? Look, I, it is, it has been notable that since the start of these hearings, the Department of Justice has let us know about a bunch of new things they've been doing with their investigation. Is this a way for Garland to sort of answer some of the criticism he's been getting, whispers from the Hill, whispers from the White House, um, because all of a sudden you see subpoenas being issued. You see a, a phone being seized from a Nevada Republican Party chair, the Georgia Republican Party chair. And all of a sudden you're like, whoa, Department of Justice feels like it's suddenly um, getting more aggressive. Look, it is, I think the, the reason why the committee's been so frustrated, and I've been talking with some of the committee members, is that they feel as if, you know, they've been peddled to the metal in their investigation. They feel as if justice opened the investigation. They have focused on the act of January 6th and have been aggressive there, but they've sort of been, yeah, they're looking at the larger issue of electors and they're looking at this stuff, but it, it has not felt urgent. And all of a sudden, the last two weeks, it's come across as a sense of urgency. I, you know, I do think that if you're Merrick Garland and you walk through the, the sort of, if you're, if you're eventually going to make a decision, whatever you decide to do with Trump, you better have sort of explored every facet of this investigation. And so, for instance, if he's going to come to the conclusion that he's not going to indict Trump, but he is going to indict all these people around him, he needs to be doing what we're seeing now, which is, look, I've looked at every avenue of this. I can't get a prosecution of him, but I can get a prosecution of these six people. Howie, and, the, and, and that's my sense of what I think is the larger picture here that, that Garland is focused yeah, Hallie, on. Hallie, the last hearing a couple of days ago, it got, it got emotional. It was personal. Yeah. A, a, a poll worker talking about being uh, targeted by the president of the United States. By contrast, what we see today, it feels like it may be a bit more granular. Um, has, has the committee continued to raise expectations of the quality of, of the information that we'll be hearing? You have to remember, this is somewhat out of order to how they initially thought that this was going to be laid out, right? So if you're looking at this as a narrative arc or the, over the course of a series of hearings, it is, um, as somebody, I think it was Playbook today, maybe talked about how it was like Star Wars. You know, there's prequels at different points, and we sort of dip in and out of the storyline, which I think feels like a fitting analogy here. I do think it will be more granular, uh, granular Lester, in that for those, um, for example, Department of Justice reporters who have been in and out of every twist and turn on this, this will feel a little familiar. I'm not sure it's going to feel like that to a lot of people in the American public who are going to be watching this across many networks who may, for the first time, right, be hearing about exactly what is happening in the machinations behind the scenes on this front. I also think to the point about what we might hear, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if there was at least some personal element here because these are top Department of Justice officials who are facing what Danny talked about, unprecedented pressure like we have not seen, right? That the only, you know, 
potential analogy we can even think about drawing is to the Saturday Night Massacre tells you how significant this was for them. And I think the committee has had an eye through this entire process. And I've spoken with members of the committee who talk about how they're trying to lay this out. They've had an eye in the process of how to make this relatable and how to make this connect to people who are watching. Right, because for them, this is about, in many ways, setting down an accurate record of history as they see it. Um, I, I think there's a lot of conversation about, is it persuading the American public, et cetera? But I do think that there may be some of the emotional piece of what was it like for Jeff Rosen as he had to sit there face to face right, with Donald Trump and tell him what you are doing is, is so wrong that I may leave. What was it like for these other witnesses who you're going to hear from? So I do think there may be some moments like that. Pat Cipollone. We ended the last right. hearing on a little bit of a yeah, we might the, see the White House lawyer. Yeah. It felt like a it felt like a um, like oh I got to binge to the next episode. <laughs> like we were left with this cliffhanger. Liz Cheney saying, "If you hear me, Pat Cipollone, okay. come come testify." Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Hallie, but it sounds like he. he there is some, we may see a vision of him today. I don't know if we meeting a, a tape yes. deposition. I have a feeling, and that's well, going to be an interesting moment. Potentially, right? The other, the other piece that we think. It's the hint we've been given. We know that we feel very confident, too, we're going to hear more about the conversations he was having because these witnesses were in those conversations with him. Mm -hmm. You know, we've talked about how Pat Cipollone, more than than others has this claim to executive privilege that others, for example, tied to the campaign who didn't work at the White House, who didn't have that privilege of the president, cannot account for. And Danny, you can speak to that. But Chuck, I think you're right. He is, if, if as you say, um, Jeffrey Clark is kind of the specter of a character hanging over this who's not seen, Pat Cipollone is, I think, right up there, too, today. Just noting that Sean Penn, in case you thought that's who you were looking oh. at, that's Sean Penn uh, in the gallery, too. Let's go back to uh, Garrett Hake, our senior Capitol Hill correspondent. Garrett, uh, talk about the, the last-minute delay for future hearings and what, what that portends. Yeah, Lester, up until a few days ago, we were expecting a full slate of hearings next week. But the committee chairman has come out and said that due to an influx in new information and new evidence since they started their hearings a couple weeks ago, they're going to delay now until potentially the middle of July. The final two hearings that we know they were planning, he's even left open the possibility there could be additional hearings beyond that. And so some of this is new evidence and some of it is evidence they want to get. You were just discussing Pat Cipollone and the effort to get him and come into testify. That is a piece of evidence the committee is still seeking. But we do know that in recent days they've gotten their hands on quite a lot of video from a documentarian by the name of Alex Holder. He's a British documentary filmmaker. He was embedded in the Trump White House and Trump campaign. You're seeing some of the video that he has released um, in recent days. He came in for a deposition today. It was quite short, only about two hours. That tells me they want the video more than they want to talk to him. Uh, we don't know, frankly, exactly what he has, only that he's got interviews with Trump and Trump family members from before and after the events of January 6th, and the committee thinks it might shed new light, although I should add that Holder has missed no opportunity to promote his documentary, and so I think uh, we're all waiting uh, quite eagerly to see what, if any, new light this video sheds, but the committee believes it is significant. Uh, Garrett, thank you, and the, the witnesses we have seen primarily through these hearings are uh, Republican witnesses. Uh, who may, in fact, be feel more damaging against the president uh, as, as they continue to make a case. Some of these highly respected uh, members of the Republican Party. Uh, today, we'll see these uh, former top Justice Department officials talk about the pressure that they say they were under. Uh, to go along with the president's scheme that, as you point out, ultimately did not mm -hmm. uh, did not carry through. Look, it's I I I do think. The Donahue testimony is going to be fascinating. Uh, I, the only thing I'm curious about here is whether we'll get some follow-ups. Danny and I were a little disappointed in the last year. It felt like these, they leave some stuff out there, and you're like, wait, draw that out of him more. Tell us a little bit more here. Um, I'll so it has to do with the, the scripted nature of the questions. It feels like it's a scripted set of answers at times. It's like they, they, they know what they want to get out of it, and you're like, well, finish that thought. I'd like to know where that went. 
some of it feels somewhat intentional. So, for example, we heard, and this goes back to something that I think we may possibly hear more about today. I referenced Republican Congressman Scott Perry, for example, who was somebody who was sympathetic to the former president's claims, lies about election fraud. Um, that got dropped in an early hearing and then sort of went nowhere, that he had apparently asked for a pardon, the committee says, something that Perry's office denies. I wonder if today is not the day that we're going to hear more about that. Any receipts the committee Maybe may more have Maybe more Perry, on that but I hear that pardon stuff is still another couple weeks away. And that, you know, some of that is a reason for the delay. There's another reason for this delay. They don't, next week could have the most consequential uh, Supreme Court decision in two generations. I do think they want to steer clear of next week. But, but at the same time, wouldn't they want the narrative to be cohesive? Is there you a could like it, is well, it, I think it's sort of a combination. They are getting more information. Um, I think you heard Benny Thompson say, we want to make sure each one of our hearings lives up to the same quality that we've delivered so far. But again, Next week also comes with that. And they were very mindful of that. They wanted to be done before these hearings, and they haven't been able to do that. By the way, another reason this hearing got delayed is, I think, Pat Cipollone. They've been they trying. Hoping. They were hoping. Yeah. They bought more time. They were hoping they could somehow convince him to do this. And unless a surprise is coming, it doesn't look like that. All right. Well, the uh, witnesses have, have entered the chambers there. We expect uh, this session, this hearing, to be gaveled in here shortly. The hearing set to begin in just a moment. What we're going to do now is pause briefly. We're going to give our NBC stations across the country a chance to join our network special report coverage. This is an NBC News special report. The results of a year-long investigation into the January 6th attack. Day five of the unprecedented congressional hearings. Today, testimony from Justice Department officials whom President Trump tried to force out over his false election fraud claims. He's become detached from reality if he really believes this stuff. As the committee tries to prove that the former president was responsible for the assault on the Capitol. President Trump summoned the mob, assembled the mob, and lit the flame of this attack. New evidence set to be revealed today as the January 6th committee makes its case to the American people. Here now is Lester Holt. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for this NBC News special report. It's day five of the January 6th Select Committee hearings, and today the panel members will be focused on the following question. Did former President Trump pressure the nation's top law enforcement agency to help overturn the 2020 election? Out of the microscope, the Department of Justice and whether or not Donald Trump, along with a high-ranking DOJ member, plotted to get some states to decertify votes. We're going to hear testimony about that and a potential scheme to shake up staffing within the department in order to advance Mr. Trump's fraudulent claims about winning the election. And just when we thought the committee would be wrapping up these hearings in the days ahead, a stunning development with so much new evidence being uncovered. The committee chairman says he's taking a pause delaying the next two hearings until sometime next month. Why? It's to sift through what one panel member calls a mountain of new information centered on how the former president directed protesters toward the Capitol on January 6th and failed to control the mob once it turned violent. We'll be discussing that new evidence, which includes some never-before-seen tape footage and interviews with the first family and Vice President Pence. We'll tell you where it came from, what it could mean for building a case January against the former president. We'll get to it all, but first we focus on today's hearings uh, just about uh, getting underway. In fact, I believe, in fact, the chairman has, has gaveled them to order. Let's take you there. The House Deposition Authority Regulation 10, the chair announces the committee's approval to release the deposition material presented during today's hearing. Good afternoon. In our previous hearings, the select committee showed that then-President Trump applied pressure at every level of government, from local election workers up to his own vice president, hoping public servants would give in to that pressure and help him steal an election he actually lost. Today, we'll tell the story of how the pressure campaign also targeted the federal agency charged with enforcement of our laws the Department of Justice. We already covered part of Mr. Trump's effort 
we heard from Attorney General Bill Barr tell the story and the, the committee about the baseless claims Mr. Trump wanted the Justice Department to investigate, and that Mr. Barr viewed those claims as nonsense. Today, we'll hear from Jeffrey Rosen, the person Mr. Trump appointed to run the Justice Department after Attorney General Barr resigned. We'll hear from other senior Justice Department officials also. Together, these public servants resisted Mr. Trump's effort to misuse the Justice Department as part of his plan to hold on to power. And we will show that Trump's demands that the department investigate baseless claims of election fraud continued into January 2021. But Donald Trump didn't just want the Justice Department to investigate. He wanted the Justice Department to help legitimize his lies, to basically call the election corrupt, to appoint a special counsel to investigate alleged election fraud, to send a letter to six state legislatures urging them to consider altering the election results. And when these and other efforts fail, Donald Trump sought to replace Mr. Rosen, the acting attorney general, with a lawyer who he believed would inappropriately put the full weight of the Justice Department behind the effort to overturn the election. Let's think about what that means. Wherever you live in the United States, there's probably a local government executive a mayor, or a county commissioner. There's also an official responsible for enforcing the laws, a district attorney or a local prosecutor. Imagine if your mayor lost a re-election bid, but instead of conceding the race, they picked up the phone, called the district attorney, and said, I want you to say this election was stolen. I want you to tell the Board of Elections not to certify the results. That's essentially what Donald Trump was trying to do with the election for President of the United States. It was a brazen attempt to use the Justice Department to advance the President's personal political agenda. Today, my colleague from Illinois, Mr. Kinzinger, and other witnesses will walk through the Select Committee's findings on these matters. But first, I recognize our distinguished vice chair, Ms. Cheney of Wyoming, for any opening statement she's cared to offer. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. At this point, uh, our committee has just begun to show America the evidence that we have gathered. There is much more to come, both in our hearings and in our report. But I'd like to take just a moment to put everything we've seen in context. We have already seen how President Trump falsely declared victory on November 3, 2020, how he and his team launched a fraudulent media campaign that persuaded tens of millions of Americans that the election was stolen from him. Donald Trump intentionally ran false ads on television and social media, featuring allegations that his advisors and his Justice Department repeatedly told him were untrue. We have also seen how Donald Trump launched a fraudulent fundraising campaign that raised hundreds of millions of dollars, again, based on those same false election fraud allegations. We have seen how President Trump and his allies corruptly attempted to pressure Vice President Pence to refuse to count lawful electoral votes and obstruct Congress's proceedings on January 6th, and how he provoked a violent mob to pursue the Vice President and others in our Capitol. We have seen how the President oversaw and personally participated in an effort in multiple states to vilify, threaten, and pressure election officials, and to use false allegations to pressure state legislators to change the outcome of the election. We have seen how President Trump worked with and directed the Republican National Committee and others to organize an effort to create fake electoral slates, and later to transmit those materially false documents to federal officials, again as part of his planning for January 6th. 
We have seen how President Trump persuaded tens of thousands of his supporters to travel to Washington, D.C. for January 6th. And we will see in far more detail how the President's rally and march to the Capitol were organized and choreographed. As you can tell, these efforts were not some minor or ad hoc enterprise concocted overnight. Each required planning and coordination. Some required significant funding. All of them were overseen by President Trump. And much more information will be presented soon regarding the President's statements and actions on January 6th. Today, as Chairman Thompson indicated, we turn to yet another element of the President's effort to overturn the 2020 election, this one involving the Department of Justice. A key focus of our hearing today will be a draft letter that our witnesses here today refused to sign. This letter was written by Mr. Jeff Clark with another Department of Justice lawyer, Ken Klukowski, and the letter was to be sent to the leadership of the Georgia State Legislature. Other versions of the letter were intended for other states. Neither Mr. Clark nor Mr. Klukowski had any evidence of widespread election fraud. But they were quite aware of what Mr. Trump wanted the department to do. Jeff Clark met privately with President Trump and others in the White House and agreed to assist the president without telling the le senior leadership of the department who oversaw him. As you will see, this letter claims that the U.S. Department of Justice's investigations have, quote, identified significant concerns that may have impacted the outcome of the election in multiple states, including the state of Georgia. In fact, Donald Trump knew this was a lie. The Department of Justice had already informed the President of the United States repeatedly that its investigations had found no fraud sufficient to overturn the results of the 2020 election. The letter also said this, quote, in light of these developments, the department recommends that the Georgia General Assembly should convene in special session, end quote, and consider approving a new slate of electors. And it indicates that a separate, quote, fake, slate of electors supporting Donald Trump has already been transmitted to Washington, D.C. For those of you who have been watching these hearings, the language of this draft Justice Department letter will sound very familiar. The text is similar to what we have seen from John Eastman and Rudy Giuliani, both of whom were coordinating with President Trump to overturn the 2020 election. When one of our witnesses today, Mr. Donahue, first saw this draft letter, he wrote this, quote, this would be a grave step for the department to take, and it could have tremendous constitutional, political, and social ramifications for the country, end quote. This committee agrees. Had this letter been released on official Department of Justice letterhead, it would have falsely informed all Americans, including those who might be inclined to come to Washington on January 6th, that President Trump's election fraud allegations were likely very real. Here is another observation about this letter. Look at the signature line. It was written by Jeff Clark and Mr. Klukowski, not just for Clark's signature, but also for our witnesses today, Jeff Rosen and Richard Donahue. When it became clear that neither Mr. Rosen nor Mr. Donahue would sign this letter, President Trump's plan necessarily changed. As you will hear today, Donald Trump offered Mr. Clark the job of acting attorney general, replacing Mr. Rosen, with the understanding that Clark would send this letter to Georgia and other states and take other actions the president requested. One other point. Millions of Americans have seen the testimony of Attorney General Barr before this committee. At one point in his deposition, the former Attorney General was asked why he authorized the Department of Justice to investigate fraud in the 2020 election at all. Why not just follow the regular course of action and let the investigations occur much later in time, after January 6th? Here's what he said. 
felt the responsible thing to do was to be to be in a position uh, to have a view as to whether or not there was fraud. And frankly, I think the fact that I put myself in the position that I could say that we had looked at this and didn't think there was fraud was really important to moving things forward. Uh, and I, I sort of shudder to think what the situation would have been if the if the position of the department was, we're not even looking at this until after Biden's in office. I'm not sure we would have had a transition at all. I want to thank each of our witnesses before us today for your role in addressing and rebutting the false allegations of fraud at the root of January 6th. And thank you for standing up for the Constitution and for the rule of law. Of course, not all public officials behaved in the honorable way our witnesses did. At the close of today's hearing, we will see video testimony by three members of Donald Trump's White House staff. They will identify certain of the members of Congress who contacted the White House after January 6th to seek presidential pardons for their conduct. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Without objection, the chair recognized the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Kinzinger, for an opening statement. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to our witnesses for being here. I'd like to start with a personal story. So in May of 2009, I returned from service in Iraq, and I announced my intention to run for Congress. A big reason I decided to run for Congress was my motivation to ensure freedom and democracy were defended overseas. I remember making a commitment out loud a few times and in my heart repeatedly, even to today, that if we are going to ask Americans to be willing to die in service to our country, we as leaders must at least be willing to sacrifice our political careers when integrity and our oath requires it. After all, losing a job is nothing compared to losing your life. Within the halls of power, in the face of a president, that commitment can easily be forgotten. Presidential pressure can be really hard to resist. Today, we'll focus on a few officials who stood firm against President Trump's political pressure campaign. When the president tried to misuse the department and install a loyalist at its helm, these brave officials refused and threatened to resign. They were willing to sacrifice their careers for the good of our country. The Department of Justice is unique in the executive branch. The president oversees the Department of Justice, yet the president's personal or partisan interests must not shape or dictate the department's actions. The president cannot and must not use the department to serve his own personal interest, and he must not use its people to do his political bidding especially when what he wants them to do is to subvert democracy. The president cannot pervert justice nor the law to maintain his power. Justice must, both in fact and law, be blind. That is critical to our whole system of self-governance. During this hearing, you'll hear time and time again about the president's request to investigate claims of widespread fraud. Our witnesses, Mr. Rosen, Mr. Donahue, and Mr. Engel, stood firm in the face of overbearing political pressure because they understood that their oath was to the Constitution and not to the personal or political interests of the president. The president and his allies became keenly aware that with legal challenges exhausted and electoral votes certified, their only hope would be a last-ditch scheme to prevent Congress from certifying the win thus throwing the entire system into constitutional chaos. The president wanted the department to sow doubt in the legitimacy of the election, to empower his followers and members of Congress to take action. If the department could just lend its credibility to the conspiracies, people would have the justification they needed to spread the big lie. So President Trump ultimately wanted the Department of Justice to say the election was, quote, corrupt, and, quote, leave the rest to me and the Republican congressmen. As you will hear today, the department's top leadership refused. Not surprisingly, President Trump didn't take no for an answer. He didn't accept it from Attorney General Barr, and he wouldn't accept it from Mr. Rosen either. So he looked for another attorney general, his third in two weeks. 
He needed to find someone who was willing to ignore the facts. That is not the norm. Let's look at what attorneys general, Democrats and Republicans alike, have said about upholding their oath to the Constitution. Attorney General uh, ultimately owes his loyalty uh, to the integrity of the American people and to the fidelity to the Constitution and the legitimate laws of the country. That's what he's ultimately required to do. I will be an independent attorney general. I will be the people's lawyer. If, however, um, there were an issue that I thought were that significant that would compromise my ability to serve uh, as attorney general in the way that I have described that as the people's lawyer, um, I would not hesitate to resign. As you and I discussed, if the president proposed to undertake a course of conduct that was in violation of the Constitution, that would present me with a, uh, a difficult but not a complex problem. I would have two choices. I could either try to talk him out of it or leave. Those are the choices. The Attorney General's position as a cabinet member is perhaps unique from all of the cabinet members. Yes, a member of the President's cabinet, but the Attorney General has a unique responsibility to provide independent and objective advice to the President or any agency um, when it is sought, and sometimes perhaps even when it is not sought. Everyone in that video, from Eric Holder to Jeff Sessions, spoke as one about the independence of the department. It's a point of pride at justice to apply the law without the president's political self-interest taining its actions or dictating how it uses its authorities. But President Trump did find one candidate at justice who seemed willing to do anything to help him stay in power. Let's hear what President Trump's own lawyer, Eric Hirschman, had to say about Jeff Clark's plan to overturn the election. I'd like to advise viewers this video contains some strong language. And when he finished discussing what he planned on doing, I said, good fucking, excuse me, sorry, effing a-hole. Congratulations, you just admitted a first step or act you take as attorney general would be committing a felony and violating Rule 6C. You're clearly the right candidate for this job. So who's Jeff Clark? An environmental lawyer with no experience relevant to leading the entire Department of Justice. What was his only qualification? that he would do whatever the president wanted him to do, including overthrowing a free and a fair democratic election. President Trump's campaign to bend the Justice Department to his political will culminated in a showdown on January 3rd. Today, we will take you inside that early evening Oval Office meeting where top Justice Department officials met with the president. At stake, the leadership and integrity of the Department of Justice. The, the meeting took about another two and a half hours from the time I entered. Um, it was entirely focused on whether there should be a DOJ leadership change. I was sitting directly in front of the president. Jeff Rosen was to my right, Jeff Clark was to my left. Uh, he looked at me and underscored, well, the one thing we know is you're not going to do anything. You don't and even agreed that the concerns that are being presented are, are valid. And here's someone who has, has a different view. So well, why shouldn't I do that? You know, that's how the discussion then, uh, proceeded. Jeff Clark was proposing that uh, Jeff Rosen be replaced by Jeff Clark. And I thought the proposal was Fascinating. What were Clark's purported bases for why it was in the president's interest for him to step in? What would he do? What would, how would things change, according to Mr. Clark in the meeting? He repeatedly said to the president that if he was put in the seat, he would conduct real investigations that would, in his view, uncover widespread fraud. He would send out the letter that he had drafted and that this was a last opportunity to sort of set things straight with this defective election and that he could do it. And um, he had the, the intelligence and the will and the desire to pursue these matters in the way that the president thought most appropriate. And he was making a pitch and every time he would get clobbered over the head, he would like, 
say like, you know, like a call to order, you know, the president's your decision, you get the chance to make this decision. And, you know, you've heard everybody and you can make your determination. And then we jump back in and, you know, really clobber him. Um, I made the point that Jeff Clark is not even competent to serve as the attorney general. He's never been a criminal attorney. He's never conducted a criminal investigation in his life. He's never been in front of a grand jury, much less a trial jury. Um, and he kind of retorted by saying, well, I've done a lot of very complicated appeals and civil litigation, environmental litigation, and things like that. And I said, that's right. You're an environmental lawyer. How about you go back to your office, and we'll call you when there's an oil spill? And uh, Pat Cipollone weighed in at one point, I remember saying, you know, that letter that this guy wants to send, that letter is a murder-suicide pact. It's going to damage everyone who touches it. And we should have nothing to do with that letter. I don't ever want to see that letter again. And so we went along those lines. I thought Jeff's proposal, Clark's proposal, was nuts. I mean, this guy said at a certain point, you know, listen, the best I can tell is the only thing you know about environmental and elections challenges is they both start with E. And based on your answer tonight, I'm not even certain you know that. The president said, suppose I do this, suppose I replace him, Jeff Rosen, with him, Jeff Clark. What do you do? Well, we know these men before us did the right thing. But think about what happens if these justice officials make a different decision. What happens if they bow to the pressure? What would that do to us as a democracy, as a nation? Imagine a future where the president could screen applicants to the Justice Department with one question. Are you loyal to me or to the Constitution? And it wouldn't take long to find people willing to pledge their loyalty to the man. We know many of President Trump's vocal supporters on January 6th also wanted the Justice Department to do whatever he asked, as long as it meant he could stay in power. They made sure Justice Department officials heard his message as they protested loudly in front of the department on their way to the Capitol on January 6th. Do your job! 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 Live in D.C., we're marching to the Capitol. We are at the Department of Justice right now telling these cowards to do their job! I want to take a moment now to speak directly to my fellow Republicans. Imagine the country's top prosecutor with the power to open investigations, subpoena, charge crimes, and seek imprisonment. Imagine that official pursuing the agenda of the other party instead of that of the American people as a whole. And if you're a Democrat, imagine it the other way around. Today, President Trump's total disregard for the Constitution and his oath will be fully exposed. Now, let's get this hearing underway so we can do our part to protect the freedoms that we often take for granted, so that we can see how close we came to losing it all. I now yield back to the chairman. We're joined today by three distinguished witnesses who each served in the Trump administration in the months preceding January 6th. Mr. Jeffrey Rosen served at the Department of Justice from May 2019 until January 2021. With President Trump's nomination and the confirmation of the United States Senate, he became the United States Deputy Attorney General. In December 2020, he took the mantle of Acting Attorney General. Mr. Richard Donahue has served in the Department of Justice for over 14 years. Mr. Donahue was a United States Attorney for the Eastern District of New York, then became Mr. Rosen's Principal Associate Deputy Attorney General, and finally Acting Deputy Attorney General. Mr. Donahue also served more than 20 years in the United States military, including the 82nd Airborne and the Judge Advocates General Corps. We are also joined by Mr. Stephen Engel, the former Assistant Attorney General for the Office of Legal Counsel. He was nominated by the former president and confirmed by the Senate during the Trump administration. 
He served from November 2017 to January 2021 and has now returned to private practice. I will now swear in our witnesses. The witnesses will please stand and raise their right hands. Do you swear on the penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Thank you. You may be seated. Let the record reflect the witnesses all answered in the affirmative. I now recognize myself for questions. First of all, gentlemen, thank you for being here today. All of you served at former President Trump's pleasure at the Department of Justice in top leadership positions with tremendous responsibilities. Former Attorney General Bill Barr told the Select Committee that before he left the department in December 2020, he told President Trump on at least three occasions there was no evidence of widespread election fraud that would have changed the results of the presidential election and refuted numerous specific claims of election fraud the president was making. Mr. Rosen, after Mr. Barr announced his resignation, did Donald Trump continue to demand that the Department of Justice investigate his claims of election fraud? Uh, yes. He, he uh, asserted that he thought the Justice Department had not done enough. Thank you. From the time you took over from Attorney General Barr until January 3rd, how often did President Trump contact you or the department to push allegations of election fraud? So between December 23rd and January 3rd, the president either called me or met with me virtually every day, with one or two exceptions, like Christmas Day. Um, and before that, because uh, I had been announced that I would become the acting attorney general before the date I actually did, the president had asked that uh, Rich Donahue and I go over and meet with him, I believe, on December 15th as well. So after you had some of these meetings and conversations with the president, uh, what things uh, did the president raise with you? So, so the common element of all of this was the president uh, expressing his dissatisfaction that the Justice Department, in his view, had not done enough to uh, investigate election fraud. But at different junctures, uh, other topics came up at different uh, uh, intervals. So at, at one point, he had raised the question of having a special counsel for election fraud. Uh, at a number of points, he raised uh, requests that I meet with his uh, campaign counsel, Mr. Giuliani. At one point, he raised the, um, whether the Justice Department would file a lawsuit in the Supreme Court. At, at uh, a couple of junctures, there were questions about making public statements or about holding a press conference. Uh, uh, one of the later junctures uh, was this issue of sending a letter to state legislatures uh, in Georgia or other states. And um, so there were different things raised at different uh, parts of, uh, or different intervals, with the common theme being his dissatisfaction about what the Justice Department had done to uh, investigate election fraud. I will say that the Justice Department uh, declined all of those requests that I was just uh, referencing because we did not think that they were appropriate based on the facts and the law as we uh, understood them. Uh, thank you. So, Mr. Donahue, on December 15th, the day after Attorney General Barr announced his res resignation, the president summoned you and Mr. Rosen to the White House. At this meeting with the president, what did he want to discuss? There were a number of topics of discussion that day, Mr. Chairman. Um, much of the conversation focused on a report that had been recently released relating to Antrim County in Michigan, I believe on December 13th an organization called the Allied Security Group 
um, issued a report that alleged that the Dominion voting machines in that county had a 68% error rate. Um, the report was widely covered in the media. We were aware of it. Um, we obtained a copy of it on the 14th of December, the day prior. Uh, we circulated to the U.S. attorneys in Michigan for their awareness. And uh, we had a number of discussions internally, but the, the conversation with the president on that day, the 15th, was largely focused on that. Um, and he was essentially saying, have you seen this report? He was adamant that the report must be accurate, that it proved that the election was defective, that he, in fact, won the election, and the department should be using that report to uh, basically um, tell the American people that the results were not trustworthy. And he went on to other theories as well, but the bulk of that conversation on December 15th focused on Antrim County, Michigan, and the ASOG report. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Engel, we know that Attorney General Barr announced on December 1st, 2020, that the Department of Justice had found no evidence of widespread fraud that could have changed the outcome of the election. So from December 1st, 2020 until today, as you sit here, have you ever doubted that top line conclusion? No, I've, I've never had any reason to doubt Attorney General Barr's conclusion. Thank you. Pursuant to Section 5C8 of House Resolution 503, the chair now recognizes the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Kingsinger, for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In the weeks leading to January 6th, the Department of Justice was fielding almost daily requests from the president to investigate claims of election fraud. Each claim was refuted time and time again, an effort Attorney General Barr described as whack-a-mole. When each of the president's efforts failed, he resorted to installing a new attorney general to say the election was illegal and corrupt simply so he could stay in power. President Trump started leaning on the Justice Department the first chance he got on November 29th, his first television interview after the election. Where is the DOJ and the FBI in all of this, Mr. President? You have laid out some serious charges here. Shouldn't this be something that the FBI is investigating? Are they? Missing in is the DOJ investigating? Missing in action. Can't tell you where they are. Republican congressmen echoed the president just two days later. They wrote a letter to Attorney General Barr laying into the Justice Department for a, quote, shocking lack of action in investigating the claims of election fraud. That same day, Attorney General Barr stated publicly that President Trump's claims had no merit. Ignoring the top law enforcement officer in the country, Republican congressmen amplified the stolen election message to the American public. Let's listen. And so there's widespread evidence of fraud because people haven't done their jobs. Durham and Barr will deserve a big notation in history when it's written of the rise and fall of the United States if they don't clean up this mess, clean up the fraud, do your jobs, and save this little experiment in self-government. Again, I join my colleagues in calling on Attorney General Barr to immediately let us know what he's doing. We're already working on, on challenging the certified uh, uh, electors. And what about the courts? How pathetic are the courts? January 6th, I'm joining with the fighters in the Congress, and we are going to object to electors from states that didn't run clean elections. Democracy is left undefended if we accept the result of a stolen election without fighting with every bit of vigor we can muster. The ultimate date of significance is January 6th. This is how the process works. The ultimate arbiter here, the ultimate check and balance is the United States Congress. And when something is done in an unconstitutional fashion, which happened in several of these states, we have a duty to step forward and have this debate and have this vote on the 6th of January. Today is the day American patriots start taking down names and kicking ass. 
Mr. Donahue, on December 27th, you had a 90-minute conversation with the president where he raised false claim after false claim with you and Mr. Rosen. How did you respond to what you called a, quote, stream of allegations? The December 27th conversation um, was, uh, in my mind, an escalation of the earlier conversations. As the former acting AG indicated, there were a lot of communications that preceded that. As we got later in the month of December, the uh, president's entreaties became more urgent. He became more adamant that we weren't doing our job. We need to step up and do our job. Um, and he had this arsenal of allegations um, that he wanted to, um, to rely on. And so I felt in that conversation that was incumbent on, on me to make it very clear to the president what our investigations had revealed and that we had concluded, based on actual investigations, actual witness interviews, actual reviews of documents, that these allegations simply had no merit. And I wanted to try to cut through the noise because it was clear to us that there were a lot of people whispering in his ear, feeding him these conspiracy theories and allegations. And I felt that being very blunt in that conversation might help make it clear to the president that these allegations were simply not true. And so as he went through them in what for me was a 90-minute conversation or so, and what for the former acting AG was a two-hour conversation, um, as the president went through them, I went piece by piece to say, no, that's false, that is not true, and to correct him um, really in, in a serial fashion as he moved from one theory to another. Can you give me an example of one or two of those theories? So uh, one that was very clear at that point uh, was the Antrim County, the ASOG report that I mentioned earlier. The Allied Security Operations Group released this report that's at 68 percent error rate. There was, in fact, in Antrim County a hand recount. Um, had nothing to do with the department. The department did not request that. That was pursuant to litigation brought by other parties. But there was a hand recount. So they were able to compare the hand recount to what the machines had reported. And for the ballots that were actually counted by the machine, more than 15,000, um, there was one error, one ballot. Um, and I did a quick calculation and came up with 0.0063 percent error rate, which is well within tolerance. And so I made it very clear to the president, because he was so fixated on the ASOG report in the December 15th conversation, <clears throat> that, in fact, <clears throat> our investigation revealed that the error rate was 0.0063 percent. So that, Mr. President's example of what people are telling you that is not true and that you cannot and should not be relying on. Um, so that was one very explicit one, and I think you see that reflected in my notes. We went through a series of others. The uh, truck driver who uh, claimed to have moved an entire tractor trailer of ballots from New York to Pennsylvania. That was also incorrect. We did an investigation with the FBI interview witnesses at the front end and the back end of that, that trailer's um, transit from New York to Pennsylvania. We looked at loading manifests. We interviewed witnesses, including, of course, the driver. Um, and we knew it wasn't true. Uh, whether the driver believed or not was never clear to me, but it was just not true. So that was another one that I tried to educate the president on. Um, there were a series of others, mostly in swing states. Of course, he wanted to talk a great deal about Georgia, the State Farm Arena video, which he believed, for various reasons, uh, was, as he said it, fraud staring you right in the face. Were any of the allegations he brought up found credible? Did you find any of them credible? No. So during this conversation, did, did you take handwritten notes directly quoting the president? I did, and to make it clear, um, Attorney General Rosen called me on my government cell phone, said he'd been on the phone with the president for some time. The president had a lot of these allegations. Um, I was better versed in what the department had done just because I had closer contact with the investigations, and the AG asked me to get on the call. Of course, I agreed. Um, and I began taking notes only because at the outset the president made an allegation I had not heard. I had heard many of these things. I knew many of them were investigated. Um, but when the president, at least when I came to the conversation, when he began speaking, he brought up an allegation I was completely unaware of. Um, and of course that concerned us. So I simply reached out and grabbed a notepad off my wife's nightstand and a pen and I started jotting it down. That had to do with an allegation that more than 200,000 um, votes were certified in the state of Pennsylvania that were not actually cast. 
Sometimes the president would say it was 205, sometimes he would say it was 250, but I had not heard this before, and I want to get the allegation down clearly so that we can look into it if appropriate, and that's why I started taking those notes, and then as the conversation continued, I just continued to take the notes. Let's take a look at the notes, uh, if we could right now. Uh, as we can see on the screen, uh, you actually quote President Trump asking, where's DOJ, just like we heard him say in his first television interview. How did you respond to that? So both uh, the acting AG and I tried to explain to the president on this occasion and on several other occasions that the Justice Department has a very important, very specific, but very limited role in these elections. States run their elections. We are not quality control for the states. We are obviously interested in and have a mission that relates to criminal conduct in relation to federal elections. Uh, we also have related civil rights responsibilities, so we do have an important role. But the bottom line was if a state ran their election in such a way that it was defective, that is to the state or Congress to correct. It is not for the Justice Department to step in. And I certainly understood the president as a layman, not understanding why the Justice Department didn't have at least a civil role to step in and bring suit on behalf of the American people. Um, we tried to explain that to him. The American people do not constitute the client for the United States Justice Department. The one and only client of the United States Justice Department is the United States government. And the United States government does not have standing, as we were repeatedly told by our internal teams, OLC led by Steve Engel, as well as the uh, Office of the Solicitor General, researched it and gave us um, thorough, clear opinions that we simply did not have standing. And we tried to explain that to the president on numerous occasions. Let's take a, a look at another one of your notes. Uh, you also noted that Mr. Rosen said to Mr. Trump, quote, DOJ can't and won't snap its fingers and change the outcome of the election. H how did the president respond to that, sir? He responded very quickly and said, essentially, uh, that's not what I'm asking you to do. What I'm just asking you to do is just say it was corrupt and leave the rest to me and the Republican congressman. So let's now put up the notes uh, where, you, where you quote the president. Uh, as you're speaking to that, he said, the president, the president said, just say the election was corrupt and leave the rest of me and the Republican congressman. So, Mr. Donahue, that's a direct quote from President Trump, correct? That's an exact quote from the president, yes. The next note shows that even the, even that the president kept pressing, even though he'd been told that there was no evidence of fraud, did the president keep saying that the department was, quote, obligated to tell people that this was an illegal, corrupt election? That's also an exact quote from the president, yes. Let me just uh, be clear. Did the department find any evidence to conclude that there was anything illegal or corrupt about the 2020 election? There were isolated instances of uh, fraud. None of them came close to calling into question the outcome of the election in any individual state. And how would you describe the uh, president's demeanor during that call? He was more agitated than he was on December 15th. Um, the, the president throughout all of these meetings and telephone conversations was adamant that he had won and that we were not doing our job. Um, but it did escalate over time until ultimately the, the meeting on January 3rd, which was sort of the most extreme of the meetings and conversations. So I want to make sure we don't gloss this over. Just say it was corrupt and leave the rest to us. The president wanted the top Justice Department officials to declare that the election was corrupt, even though, as he knew, there was absolutely no evidence to support that statement. The president didn't care about actually investigating the facts. He just wanted the Department of Justice to put its stamp of approval on the lies. Who was going to help him? Well, Jeff Clark. Mr. Rosen, on Christmas Eve, your first official day as the acting attorney general, President Trump called you. What did he want to talk about? <clears throat> uh, the same things he was talking about publicly. He, he wanted to talk about that he thought the, uh, the election had been uh, stolen or, or was corrupt and that there was widespread fraud. And I had told him that uh, our reviews had not shown that to be the case. 
So uh, we had an extended discussion, probably 15, maybe 20 minutes, something like that, uh, with, with him uh, urging that the Department of Justice should be doing more uh, with regard to election fraud. Did he mention uh, Jeff Clark's name? Yes. Uh, it was just in passing. He made uh, uh, what I regarded as a peculiar reference. I don't remember the exact quote, but it was something about, did I know Jeff Clark or did I know who he was or something like that? And I told him I did. And then the conversation just moved on. But when I, I hung up, I was, I was uh, quizzical as to, how does the president even know uh, Mr. Clark? I was not aware that they had ever met or that the president had been involved with any of the issues in the civil division. So it was a bit of a surprise when he brought his name up? Yes. So Mr. Clark was the acting head of the civil division and head of environmental and natural resources division at the Department of Justice. Uh, do either of those divisions have any role whatsoever in investigating election fraud, sir? No. And, and to my awareness, uh, Jeff Clark had had no prior involvement of any kind with regard to the work that the department was doing uh, that Attorney General Barr has talked about to this committee. So let's take a minute and explain why the president mentioned Jeff Clark's name to Mr. Rosen here on Christmas Eve. On December 21st, some Republican members of Congress met with President Trump in the White House to talk about overturning the 2020 election. Let's hear Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene talk about how this meeting got set up. I was the only new member at the meeting. I called President Trump on Saturday and, and said, we've got to have a meeting. Uh, there's many of us that feel like this election has been stolen. So on the screen, you'll see that President Trump's chief of staff, Mark Meadows, tweeted about that meeting right after it happened. He said, quote, several members of Congress just finished a meeting in the Oval Office with President Donald Trump, preparing to fight back against mounting evidence of voter fraud. Stay tuned. On the same day he met with these Republican members of Congress, President Trump called into a conservative political convention, and he used the opportunity to pressure the Department of Justice to investigate his bogus claims. The problem is we need a party that's going to fight, and we have some great congressmen and women that are doing it, and we have others, some great fighters, but we won this in a landslide. They know it, and we need backing from, like, the Justice Department and other people have to finally step up. The Select Committee obtained records from the National Archives that show that Scott Perry was one of the congressmen who joined that meeting. We learned from White House records that you'll now see on the screen that the very next day, Representative Perry returned to the White House. This time, he brought a Justice Department official named Jeffrey Clark. Representative Perry provided the following statement to his local TV affiliate. He said, quote, throughout the past four years, I've worked with Assistant Attorney General Clark on various legislative matters. When President Trump asked if I would make an introduction, I obliged. But why Jeff Clark? Let's hear Mr. Giuliani explain the kind of person that he and the president wanted at the top of justice. I don't remember ever recommending to anybody that um, Mr. Clark, meaning Jeffrey Clark at DOJ, be given election-related responsibilities. You mean beyond the president? Correct. Well, beyond the president, I do recall saying to people that um, somebody should be put in charge of the Justice Department who isn't uh, fr uh, frightened of what's going to be done to their reputation. Um, because the judgment was filled with people like that. Should put somebody that's not frightened of what's going to be done to their reputation. Mr. Donahue, when you told uh, the president that you wouldn't pursue baseless claims of fraud, was it because you were worried about your reputation? No, not at all. Mr. Clark's name uh, was also mentioned in the White House in, in late December and early January as described by a top aide 
to Mark Meadows, Cassidy Hutchinson. Was it your understanding that Representative Perry was pushing for a specific person to take over the department? He wanted Mr. Clark, Mr. Jeff Clark to take over the Department of Justice. Mr. Rosen, after your call with President Trump on December 24th, you spoke with Mr. Clark on December 26th about his contact with the president. Can you tell us about that conversation? Yes. Um, because I had been quizzical about why his name had come up, I called him and I uh, tried to explore if he would share uh, if there was something I ought to know. And after some back and forth, he acknowledged that shortly before Christmas, he had gone to a meeting in the Oval Office with the President. That, of course, uh, surprised me, and uh, I asked him, how did that happen? And he was defensive. He said it, it had been unplanned, that he had been talking to uh, someone he referred to as uh, General Perry, but I believe as Congressman Perry, and that unbeknownst to him, he was asked to go to a meeting, and he didn't know it, but it turned out it, it was at the Oval, he found himself at the Oval Office, and, uh, and he was apologetic for that. And I said, well, you didn't tell me about it. It wasn't authorized, and you didn't even tell me after the fact. You know, this is not, not appropriate. Uh, but he was contrite and said it had been inadvertent and it would not happen again, and that if anyone asked him to go to such a meeting, he would notify Rich Donahue and me. Is there a policy that governs uh, who, who can have contact directly with the White House? Yes. So across many administrations for, for uh, a long period of time, there's a policy that, uh, particularly with regard to criminal investigations, restricts at both the White House end and the Justice Department end those more sensitive issues to the highest ranks. So for criminal matters, the policy for a long time has been that only the Attorney General and the Deputy Attorney General from the DOJ side can have conversations about criminal matters with the White House, uh, or the Attorney General, the Deputy Attorney General can authorize someone for a specific item with their permission, but the idea is to make sure that the top rung of the Justice Department knows about it and is in the thing to control it and make sure only appropriate things are done. Mr. Ringo, from your perspective, why is it important to have a, a policy like Mr. Rosen just discussed? <laughs> Well, it's critical that the Department of Justice conducts its criminal investigations free from either the reality or any appearance of political interference. And so people can get in trouble uh, if people at the White House are speaking with people at the department. And that's why the purpose of these, these policies uh, is to keep these communications as infrequent and at the highest levels as possible, uh, just to make sure that people who are uh, less careful about it, who don't really understand these implications, such as Mr. Clark, uh, don't run afoul uh, of, the, of those contact policies. Thank you. So the select committee conducted an informal interview with the White House counsel, Pat Cipollone, and his deputy, Pat Philbin, about their contact with Mr. Clark, uh, though neither has yet agreed to sit for transcribed and videotaped interviews. But Pat Cipollone told the select committee that he intervened when he heard Mr. Clark was meeting with the president about legal matters without his knowledge, which was strictly against White House policy. Mr. Cipollone and Mr. Philbin, like Mr. Rosen, told Mr. Clark to stand down, and he didn't. On the same day, Acting Attorney General Rosen told Mr. Clark to stop talking to the White House, Representative Perry was urging Chief of Staff Mark Meadows to elevate Clark within the Department of Justice. You can now see on the screen behind me a series of texts between Representative Perry and Mr. Meadows. They show that Representative Perry requested that Mr. Clark be elevated within the department. Representative Perry tells Mr. Meadows on December 26th that, quote, Mark, just checking in as time continues to count down. 11 days to January 6th and 25 days to inauguration, we've got to get going. Representative Perry followed up and says, quote, Mark, you should call Jeff. I just got off the phone with him, and he explained to me why the principal deputy won't work, especially with the FBI. They will view it as not having the authority to enforce what needs to be done. Mr. Meadows responds with, I got it. I think I understand. Let me work on the deputy position. Representative Perry then texts, Roger, just sent you something on signal. Just sent you an updated file. 
did you call Jeff Clark? Mr. Donahue, uh, Representative Perry called you the next day uh, on December 27th. Who, who told him to call you? My understanding is the president did at the outset of the call, Congressman Perry told me that he was calling at the behest of the president. What did, what did he want to talk about? He wanted to talk about Pennsylvania in particular. Um, he gave me some background about, you know, why he in particular doesn't trust the FBI and why the American people don't necessarily trust the FBI. And then he went into some allegations specific to Pennsylvania, which included, amongst others, this allegation that uh, the Secretary of State had certified more votes than were actually cast. Did you uh, direct the local, U the local U.S. Attorney's Office to investigate that claim? So Mr. Perry said that he had a great deal of information, that uh, investigations had been done, that there was some sort of uh, forensic-type report that would be helpful to me. And I, I didn't know Congressman Perry. I'd never heard of him before this conversation. But I said, sir, if you've got something that you think is relevant to what the Justice Department's mission is, you should feel free to send it to me. I um, mean, he did. And I was en route from New York to Washington. I got it. I looked at it on my iPhone. Obviously, I couldn't read the whole thing in, that, in transit like that. But I looked at it to get a feel for what it was. And then I forwarded it to the um, United States Attorney for the Western District of Pennsylvania. Did they get back to you? What did they conclude? Scott Brady looked at it. He was the Western District of Pennsylvania U.S. Attorney. Um, took him a couple of days, but um, he got back in relatively short order with a pretty clear explanation for why there was no foundation for concern. The Secretary of State had not certified more votes than were actually cast. The difference between the 5.25 that was actually certified by the Secretary of State and the 5 million that was on a public-facing website was that the information on the website was incomplete because four counties had not uploaded their data. So no credibility to that. There was claim. zero to that, right. During that call, did uh, Scott Perry mention Mr. Clark, and uh, what did he say about him, if so? He did. He mentioned Mr. Clark. Um, he said uh, something to the effect of, uh, I think Jeff Clark is great, and I think he's the kind of guy who could get in there and do something about this stuff. And this was coming on the heels of the president having mentioned Mr. Clark in the uh, afternoon call earlier that day. I'd like to yield to the gentlewoman uh, from Wyoming, Vice Chair Cheney. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Kinzegar. I thank the gentleman for yielding. As uh, we discussed earlier, at the center of Mr. Clark's plan to undo President Trump's election loss uh, was a letter. Mr. Donahue, on December 28th, Mr. Clark emailed you and Mr. Rosen a draft letter that he wanted you to sign uh, and send to Georgia state officials. You testified that this could have, quote, grave constitutional consequences. Mr. Donahue, can you tell us what you meant by that? Well, I had to read uh, both the email and the attached letter twice to make sure I really understood what he was proposing because it was so extreme to me. I had a hard time getting my head around it initially. Um, but I read it and I did understand it for what he intended. and. Um, I had to sit down and sort of compose what I thought was an appropriate response. I actually initially went next door to the acting AG's office, uh, but he was not there. Uh, we were both on that email. I, I knew we would both have probably a very similar reaction to it. He was not in his office, so I returned to my office and I sat down to draft a response because I thought it was very important to give a prompt response rejecting this out of hand. Um, there were, in, in my response, I explained a number of reasons this is not the department's role. Um, to suggest or dictate to state legislatures how they should select their electors. Uh, but more importantly, this was not based on fact. This was actually contrary to the facts as developed by department investigations over the last several weeks and months. Um, so I responded to that, and for the department to insert itself into the political process this way, I think would have had grave consequences for the country. It may very well have spiraled us into a constitutional crisis, and I wanted to make sure that he understood the gravity of the situation because he didn't seem to really appreciate it. And what was Mr. Clark's reaction when you uh, sent this email to him? He didn't respond directly to the email, but we met shortly after that. After I sent the email, um, the acting AG returned. I went to his office. He had just read it. He had a very similar reaction to me. He was exasperated, and he told me that he had told one of his administrative assistants to get 
Jeff Clark up here. We want to talk to him face to face about this. And so the three of us then had a meeting, probably around 1800 that night, in the uh, Deputy Attorney General's conference room. And one of the things that you said to Mr. Clark is, quote, what you are doing is nothing less than the United States Justice Department meddling in the outcome uh, of a presidential election. And I assume you conveyed that to him as well in your meeting that evening? Yes, in those very words. It was a very contentious meeting, but um, yes, that was said amongst other things. Um, and despite this contentious meeting and your strong reaction to the letter, um, did Mr. Clark continue to push his concept in the coming days? He did, yes. Um, we had subsequent meetings and conversations. Um, the acting AG probably had more contact with him than I did. Uh, but between the 28th and the 2nd, when we had another in-person meeting, um, he clearly continued to, to move down this path. He began calling witnesses and apparently conducting investigations of his own. Um, and uh, he got a briefing from DNI about purported foreign intelligence uh, interference. Um, and we thought perhaps once it was explained to him that there was no basis for that part of his concern that he would retreat. Uh, but instead he doubled down and said, well, okay, so there's no foreign interference. Um, I still think there are enough allegations out there that we should go ahead and send this letter, which shocked me even more than the initial one because you would think after a couple of days of looking at this, he, like we, would have come to the same conclusion that it was completely unfounded. And when you learned that he had been uh, calling witnesses and conducting investigations on his own, did you confront him? Yes. And uh, what was his reaction? He got very defensive. Um, you know, as I said, there were a series of conversations through that week. I, I certainly remember very specifically the conversation in the meeting on January 2nd. Um, that got even more confrontational. But uh, he was defensive and, um, you know, similar to his earlier reaction when I said this is nothing less than Justice Department meddling in an election, his reaction was, I think a lot of people have meddled in this election. Um, and so he kind of clung to that and then spewed out some of these theories, some of which we'd heard from the president, but others which were floating around the internet and media, um, and just kept insisting that the department needed to act and needed to send those letters. Um, the committee has also learned that um, Mr. Clark was uh, working with another attorney at the department named Ken Klukowski, um, who drafted this letter to Georgia with Mr. Clark. Mr. Klukowski um, had arrived at the department on December 15th with just 36 days left until the inauguration. Um, he was specifically assigned to work under Jeff Clark. And Mr. Klukowski also worked with John Eastman, who we showed you at our hearing last week, was one of the primary architects of President Trump's scheme to overturn the election. The Georgia letter that we've been discussing uh, specifically talks about some of Dr. Eastman's theories, including, quote, the purpose of the special session the department recommends would be for the General Assembly to determine whether the election failed to make a proper and valid choice between the candidates, such that the General Assembly could take whatever action is necessary to ensure that one of the slates of electors cast on December 14th will be accepted by Congress on January 6th. The committee's also learned that the relationship between Dr. Eastman and Mr. Klukowski persisted after Mr. Klukowski joined the Justice Department. Let's take a look at an email recommending that Mr. Klukowski and Dr. Eastman brief Vice President Pence and his staff. Other recipients of this email included the Chief of Staff to Congressman Louis Gohmert. And the email says, as stated last week, I believe the Vice President and his staff would benefit greatly from a briefing by John and Ken. As I also mentioned, we want to make sure we don't overexpose Ken, given his new position. This email suggests that Mr. Klukowski was simultaneously working with Jeffrey Clark to draft the proposed letter to Georgia officials to overturn their certified election and working with Dr. Eastman to help pressure the Vice President to overturn the election. I want to thank all of our witnesses for being here today and, and for answering our questions about this letter and other issues. We asked Mr. Clark some of the same questions that we've asked you, and here's how he answered. Did you discuss this draft letter to Georgia officials with the President of the United States? Fifth and executive privilege, again, 
just restated for the abundance of caution. Okay, if you look again at the draft letter in the first paragraph, second sentence says, the department will update you as we are able on investigatory progress, but at this time we have identified significant concerns that may have impacted the outcome of the election in multiple states, including the state of Georgia. Isn't that, in fact, contrary to what Attorney General Barr had said uh, on December 1st, 2020? Yes. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Mr. Chairman, I reserve. Pursuant to the order of the committee of today, the chair declares the committee in recess for a period of approximately 10 minutes. We will take those 10 minutes right now to update you where we are in uh, this hearing. The committee taking a break. Let's give you some of the highlights of the testimony we just heard about allegations. Then President Trump pressured the Department of Justice to take action to overturn the 2020 election results. First, the committee presented a draft of a letter penned in December 2020. It was by former DOJ lawyer Jeff Clark. The draft letter claims that the U.S. Department of Justice's investigations have, quote, identified significant concerns that may have impacted the outcome of the election in multiple states, including the state of Georgia. DOJ higher-ups, including the acting AG at the time, refused to sign the letter. Next, today's witnesses outlined a plot by Jeff Clark that helping un uh, uncover election fraud should earn him the DOJ's top spot. And for his loyalty to Trump, he should replace acting U.S. AG uh, Jeffrey Rosen. Finally, it was revealed that even after Bill Barr told President Trump there was no evidence of widespread election fraud and then resigned, the president continued to pressure Department of Justice officials to keep investigating, investigating what he said was a stolen election, and he urged them to declare that the election was corrupt. NBC News senior Capitol Hill correspondent Garrett Hake is just outside the hearing room. What stood out to you so far? Well, Lester, the committee had to deal with a lot of characters here who are not necessarily going to be familiar with the American people, including Jeff Rosen, the former acting attorney general, and Jeff Clark, who they really tried to make a central figure in this, a, a player who was introduced to the president by a Republican congressman well after the election was over, and someone whom other officials within the DOJ and other White House attorneys found to be deeply unqualified to be in the deep legal waters in which he was swimming. I'm going to play some of the explanation of Clark and his ideas that the committee just played that I think will stick with a lot of people. And uh, Pat Cipollone weighed in at one point, I remember saying, you know, that letter that this guy wants to send, that letter is a murder-suicide pact. It's going to damage everyone who touches it. And we should have nothing to do with that letter. I don't ever want to see that letter again. And so we went along those lines. I thought Jeff's proposal, Clark's proposal, was nuts. I mean, this guy said at a certain point, you know, listen, the best I can tell is the only thing you know about environmental and elections challenges is they both start with E. The letter, the proposal there being described as this letter Clark had drafted that would go from the Department of Justice to several states saying that DOJ, saying falsely that DOJ had found significant fraud in those states. I think it was that letter, that moment that we heard so many of these other attorneys and high-ranking Department of Justice officials describing that so alarmed the men who are testifying today. Lester. Garrett, thanks. I'm joined again by Hallie Jackson, our senior Washington correspondent, and Chuck Todd, NBC's political director and moderator of Meet the Press. Uh, let me start with you, Hallie. Sure. Uh, what has stood out to you so far? There's a couple of things. Let me take them bucket by bucket. First, there's the Trump factor here that the committee has laid out pretty clearly uh, in their view that Donald Trump was told that the conspiracy theories he was pushing were wrong, were not accurate, were not substantiated by his top DOJ officials, and yet he continued to push them to just say the election was corrupt and leave them to me and the Republican congressman. That's one piece of it, what Donald Trump knew and what he did with that knowledge. Number two is the Clark factor here. Jeffrey Clark was told 
that what he was trying to do was illegal. You heard that in that colorful testimony from Eric Hirschman, who came on and said in, with extreme sarcasm, congratulations, you just admitted the first thing you would do as an attorney general would be commit a felony, essentially. So Je Jeffrey Clark knew that what he, or was it told, at least by another attorney, that what he was trying to do would violate the law um, and that those conspiracies lacked uh, s substantiation, if you will. And then there's these details that I think are critical here. We talked about Pat Cipollone, the White House counsel, the committee at, at the end of the last year and very clearly called him out. They want to hear from him formally. They confirmed that they have spoken with him informally, that he sat and discussed various issues in and around the White House with them uh, and said to Jeffrey Clark, stand down. And he did not. So it's more insight now to the committee's conversations with Pat Cipollone, with people who were close to Donald Trump at the time, which I think are illuminating. And then the last thing I'll say, and we're going to hear about it more after the break, Members of Congress, like Republican yeah. Congressman Scott Perry, this was extraordinary detail of the lengths that Congressman Perry went to to bring Jeffrey Clark into Donald Trump's inner circle, talking, texting with the then chief of staff, Mark Meadows. That's a thread that I think they're going to be pulling on when we come back. Chuck, this letter um, taken by itself, you could read it in a lot of ways, but it would have had a major impact had it gone out. A hundred percent. And what I'm struck by is sort of the sophistication of the planning to, this was their sort of last-ditch effort, which was to get states to consider alternative slates of electors so that on January 6th they could do what, what they wanted Mike Pence to do. Because think about the timing of this. So Jeffrey Clark writes a letter in December, mid-December, after the electors have met and voted. We do not know at this point that alternative slates of electors have somehow met and voted and that were submitted, right? So what happens? We now see in this letter, he says, look, we recommend that your General Assembly decide which slate of electors. And you sit there and go, what do you mean? There's two slates of electors? Point is, backtrack this. That they had to, those electors had to meet by December 14th. So here he is writing this letter on December 28th. I, I really think the committee is painting a picture of a, of, of a more sophisticated conspiracy mm -hmm. than any of us gave it credit to. I mean, look, you've got this young lawyer Perhaps he was impressionable for whatever reason that was working in the White House, that clearly Donald Trump, he, he seemed to sort of gather his own sort of team, right? So he plucks one guy at a White House counsel. He somehow shows up in DOJ to start assisting Jeffrey Clark in how to write these letters. Scott Perry seems to make this connection with one person here. And it's like there was some people that professionals operating in the White House, like Cipollone, like the acting attorney general, who are going, what the hell's going on here? And every time they're turning around, there's somebody, oh, oh, so who's this Ken guy? And he came from over here. This was, again, every day we say this, um, the biggest mistake that I think we all have made in covering Trump is always assuming it's Keystone Cops and a parody and a caper and all this stuff. When you see what, certainly what Jeffrey Clark was doing, this was a more sophisticated scheme. And they impl implemented a lot more of it than I think we fully appreciate, well, the committee from the, including the alternative slate of the elections. The committee from the get-go of these hearings has kind of made this point that this thing is going to lay out. It was not happenstance. we truly got dots connecting. Mm -hmm. All right. Washington correspondent uh, Yamish Alcindor is, is with us now. Yamish, uh, Justice Department essentially put in a, a lot of resources to try to investigate some of these claims. What's so striking about what we just heard was just how much resources the Department of Justice put into claims of election fraud. All of the resources. You have Attorney General Bill Barr saying that he was running these down and he didn't want to wait until President Biden was coming into office because he wanted to be able to say to President Trump, I looked into these and these are false. He thought that that would get him to finally calm down and finally put these away. I also think it's interesting that Jeffrey Clark, he's meeting with people. He's calling up right. witnesses. He's conducting his own in in investigation. That also is money and resources of the Department of Justice, something that the officials continue to say is supposed to be representing the United States of America, not the president. I am struck also by the fact that President Trump went through so many attorney generals, right? There was Jeff Sessions who he put out because he didn't want to, to get involved in the Russia investigation. Then he arrives at A.G. Barr, who then leaves because he says, look, after the election, President Trump was someone who you could not even argue with anymore. He would not listen. Before, he was, he was lying. 
thing. There were things that we could at least debate about afterwards. He was someone who was unleashed, detached from reality. Then he has Jeffrey Rosen, but it's in Jeffrey Clark that he starts seeing the type of attorney general that he was really looking for his entire presidency, someone who was as obsessed with these lies as he was, someone who would not put this down, would not put this bone down. So I'm really struck by the fact that finally, in some ways, former President Trump was looking at someone and saying, this is the kindred spirit. This is the sort of legal officer that I want to do my bidding, someone who really sees his position as only furthering my own political benefit. And lastly, I think it's I'm struck by the fact that that, that, that that note, that handwritten note says, leave it up to the Republican congressman. I think it goes right back to what um, Rusty Bowers uh, from Arizona told us, which is that he was told, you're a Republican. Why aren't you playing along here? Why aren't you more open to overturning this election? Essentially, the president of the United States was saying, look, I have a party that is willing to do everything that it takes for me to hold on to power lawfully or unlawfully. Why can't you also get on board? Yeah, Mish, thank you very much. Danny, let me bring you back in this. As I watch, I can't help wonder, reminding ourselves once again, this is not a criminal proceeding, it's not an impeachment. I can't help wonder what it would look like if these witnesses were being challenged. Do you, you know, as, as someone who works in the law, do you, do you see that? It, would, it, would it change any of the, the, the larger strokes here? There's no question that this has been a one-sided affair. It's like a grand jury proceeding. Only the prosecution is presenting their evidence and questioning the witnesses. The defense attorneys aren't even in the room. But if they were, uh, there isn't a whole lot factually to dispute unless it's going to be what was said and who said it. And we've already seen that, by the way. Donald Trump, as to the Arizona member of the legislature, came out before he testified and said, hey, that guy told me uh, that there was fraud and he, he backed up my story, which, of course, you know, Rusty denied when he got on the stand. Uh, so in a case like this, yes, we're hearing one side, but the only defense that's really shaping up is essentially one of knowledge, one of I didn't know any better and I proceeded based on the advice of my attorneys. That advice may have been bad, but I proceeded based on smart people telling me that I had a basis to move forward. But, you know, again and again, you, you have to start saying that Trump's defense is getting smaller and smaller for that knowledge element, because at some point, that lack of knowledge becomes willful blindness. And but, willful blindness is not a defense. Well, that's interesting, because we hear some of the same language from him even now. If, if he believes this, if he truly believes it was a fraudulent election, that, that he's the rightful president, is, is there anything legally that can touch him? Right. But does he truly believe that? Because, you know, in reality, in the law, we never know exactly what resides in the recesses of the brain. So prosecutors use circumstantial evidence to prove beyond a reasonable doubt what somebody thought or believed at the time. And time and time again, you have evidence of people telling Trump there's no there there, uh, telling Trump that there is no fraud. Here's the evidence. What do you have to to refute that. And basically, it's just theories. And in fact, I have to say, after listening to this for many days now, and maybe you've heard something that I haven't, I haven't heard a concrete piece of evidence that Trump has ever cited in any of his discussions with people that says, oh, here is a solid piece of evidence that there's election fraud. It's just basically, and you heard this with Raffensperger, no, I know we won. I know we won. I just know it because I know it. And just knowing it because you know it at a certain point, is not knowledge. And I think that's what the committee's trying to do here is chip away at the idea of good faith belief that Trump may have had. And of course, the other challenge that the committee has is all of the, and it's a popular word from the movie The Godfather, the buffers, the people that Trump puts between him uh, to essentially take the heat. And you're going to see Jeffrey Clark is one of those buffers that's going to have uh, a lot of problems. He's not going to come out looking very good after this hearing. And Trump's probably going to claim didn't know anything about it. The hearing has been uh, gaveled in. Let's take you there. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, around the time uh, Mr. Clark was pushing for the department to send the Georgia letter, the president and his supporters were pressuring the Justice Department to take other actions to change the outcome of the 2020 election. Mr. Engel, uh, or you were the head of the Office of Legal Counsel. Can you, you first off explain your role? What is that? Sure. Uh, <clears throat> one of the Attorney General's most important responsibilities is to provide legal advice to the President and to the Executive Branch. Uh, as a practical matter, given the responsibilities of the Attorney General, the Assistant Attorney General for the Office of Legal Counsel exercises that, uh, that job on a day-to-day -day basis. And so 
in addition, uh, the head of OLC often functions as a, a, a general counsel, essentially to the attorney general, uh, and so is often, you know, the chief legal advisor to the AG, as well as, you know, the, the White House and the executive branch more broadly. So given that role, can you kind of describe your relationship with the president? Well, I, you know, in connection with my role at OLC, uh, over the course of my tenure there, there were a number of instances in which uh, folks at the White House would, would seek to uh, bring me in to provide uh, legal advice uh, to the president, uh, sometimes discussing the legal options uh, that could be pursued among various policy, to reach various policy objectives, uh, sometimes to advise the president that uh, a course of action that they had been discussing was not legally available. So I want to ask you about uh, two things the president asked you and the department to do. The first is reflected in this email that we're going to put on the screen. The president sent a draft lawsuit to be filed by the department in the Supreme Court. He wanted you, Mr. Rosen, and Mr. Cipollone specifically to review it. You and the department opposed filing it. We see on the screen here that the, talk, the talking points that you actually drafted on that. So you stated that there is no legal basis to bring this lawsuit. Uh, anyone who thinks otherwise simply doesn't know the law, much less the Supreme Court. Uh, why was this the department's position? Well, I mean, I think that it was it, you know, the, the memo sort of speaks to this, but uh, essentially this was a draft lawsuit that apparently was prepared by people outside the department. Uh, it would be styled as brought by the United States and by the, the acting Solicitor General uh, as an original jurisdiction matter in the Supreme Court. Uh, it, it was a meritless lawsuit that was not something that the department could or, or would bring. You know, somebody obviously prepared it, to, handed it to the president, and he, he forwarded it on for our review. But uh, that memo explains why the Department of Justice, as uh, Mr. Donahue said earlier, uh, doesn't have any standing. Uh, to bring such a lawsuit. Uh, the lawsuit would have been untimely. Uh, the states had chosen their electors. The electors had been certified. They'd cast their votes. They'd been sent to Washington, D.C. Neither Georgia nor any of the other states on December 28th or whenever this was, was in a position to change those votes. The, essentially, the election had happened. The only thing that hadn't happened was the formal counting of the votes. Uh, and so, obviously, you know, the person who drafted this lawsuit didn't really understand uh, in my view, you know, the law and or how the Supreme Court works or the Department of Justice. So it was just not something we were going to do. And the acting attorney general asked me to prepare a memo with talking points so that he could explain uh, our reasons uh, when he spoke with the president about this. So would you say it was an unusual request? Uh, it was certainly. An un you said the, the request that, that the department file a lawsuit from uh, drafted by outside lawyers was certainly an unusual request. There was another issue you were asked to look into. In mid-December, did the White House ask Attorney General Barr to consider whether a special counsel could be appointed to look into election fraud issues? I, I, yes. Um, I mean, the, the, I, I think the president was probably vocal at the time that he believed that special counsel was something that should be considered to look into uh, election fraud. And there is a specific you know, request where the attorney general sought my legal advice in, in the middle of December. And what was your conclusion? What conclusion did you well, reach? So, so this, this request was whether the, uh, whether the attorney general could appoint as a special counsel uh, a state attorney general uh, to conduct an investigation. I mean, as, as a legal matter, uh, under federal law, the attorney general actually has fairly wide discretion to delegate prosecutorial authority, in, including to uh, state prosecutors, which happens to assist the department, uh, you know, and not uncommonly, obviously, a state attorney general exercising prosecutorial authority on behalf of uh, the Department of Justice would be fairly uncommon. Uh, when we looked at the issue, what we saw is actually that the state law, the state was Louisiana, uh, that the state uh, law precluded the Louisiana Attorney General from accepting any position, uh, any official position uh, on behalf of the United States government. So that, that answered the question that it was not legally available. So during your time at the department, was there ever any basis to appoint a special counsel to investigate President Trump's election fraud claims? Well, well, neither Attorney General Barr nor Acting Attorney General Rosen did appoint a special counsel. Um, we, you would appoint a special counsel when uh, the department, when there's a basis for an investigation and the department essentially has a conflict of interest. It's, it's important to get someone who's independent outside the department to handle such an investigation. Uh, neither Attorney General Barr nor Acting Attorney General Rosen ever believed that that was appropriate or necessary in this case. In fact, Attorney General Barr had already told the president that there was no need for this special counsel. He actually stated that publicly, and we'll see that here in a video from December 21st. Um, 
to the extent that uh, there's an inv investigation, I think that it's being handled responsibly and professionally uh, currently within the, the department. And to this point, I have not seen a reason to appoint a special counsel, and I have no plan to do so before I leave. So remember that December 21st was the same day President Trump met with Republican members at the White House to strategize about how to overturn the election while his attorney general is out telling the public, again, that there was no widespread evidence of election fraud. And yet, two days later, we have President Trump tweeting, again publicly pressuring the department to appoint a special counsel. He said, quote, after seeing the massive voter fraud in the 2020 presidential election, I disagree with anyone that thinks a strong, fast, and fair special counsel is not needed immediately. This was the most corrupt election in the history of our country, and it must be closely examined. The Select Committee's investigation revealed that President Trump went as far as to promise the job of special counsel to now discredited former Trump campaign lawyer Sidney Powell at a late night meeting on December 18th. And then on, on Friday, he had asked me to be a special counsel to address the election uh, issues and to collect evidence. And he was extremely frustrated with the lack of, I would call it, law enforcement by any of the government agencies that are supposed to act to protect the rule of law in our republic. So let's think here, what would a special counsel do? With only days to go until election certification, it wasn't to investigate anything. An investigation led by a special counsel would just create an illusion of legitimacy and provide fake cover for those who would want to object, including those who stormed the Capitol on January 6th. All of President Trump's plans for the Justice Department were being rebuffed by Mr. Rosen, Mr. Donahue, Mr. Engel, and others. The President became desperate entering into the new year with January 6th fast approaching. President Trump rushed back early from Mar-a-Lago on December 31st and called an emergency meeting with the department's leadership. Here's Mr. Donahue describing the last minute meeting held at the White House on New Year's Eve. The president was a little more agitated than he had been on the meeting, in the meeting on the 15th. Um, he discussed a variety of election matters. He did say, this sounds like the kind of thing that would warrant appointment of a special counsel. There was a point at which the president said something about, why don't you guys seize machines? Mr. Rosen, the president asked you to seize voting machines from state governments. What was your response to that request? <clears throat> that we, had, we had seen nothing improper with regard to the voting machines, and I told them that the the uh, real experts at that had been at DHS, and they had briefed us that uh, they had looked at it and that there was nothing wrong with the, the voting machines. And so that was not something that was appropriate to do. So there would be no factual basis to seize machines. Mr. Donahue, can I, you— I don't think there was legal authority either. Yeah, Mr. Donahue, can you explain what the uh, president did uh, after he was told that the Justice Department would not seize voting machines? The president was very agitated by the acting attorney general's response um, and uh, to the extent that uh, machines and, and the technology was being discussed, the acting attorney general said that the uh, DHS, Department of Homeland Security, has expertise in machines um, and certifying them and making sure that the states are operating them properly. And since DHS had been mentioned, the president yelled out to his secretary, get Ken Cuccinelli on the phone. Um, and she did in very short order. Mr. Cuccinelli was on the phone. He was the number two at DHS at the time. I was on the speaker phone. And the president essentially said, Ken, I'm sitting here with the acting attorney general. He just told me it's your job to seize machines, and you're not doing your job. And Mr. Cuccinelli responded. 
Mr. Rosa, did you ever tell the president that the Department of Homeland Security could seize voting machines? No, certainly not. Mr. Donahue, during this meeting, did the president tell you that he would remove you and Mr. Rosen because you weren't declaring there was election fraud? Toward the end of the meeting, um, the president, again, was getting very agitated, and uh, he said, people tell me I should just get rid of both of you. I should just remove you and um, make a change in the leadership, put Jeff Clark in, maybe something will finally get done. Um, and I responded, as I think I had earlier in the December uh, 27th call, Mr. President, you should have the leadership that you want. But understand, the United States Justice Department functions on facts, evidence, and law. And those are not going to change. So you can have whatever leadership you want, but the department's position is not going to change. The President's White House counsel, Pat Cipollone, was also present. Do you remember what his position was? Pat was very supportive. Uh, Pat Cipollone, throughout these conversations, was extremely supportive of the Justice Department. He was consistent. Um, I think he had an impossible job at that point, but he did it well, and he always sided with the Justice Department in these discussions. So let's pause for a second. It's New Year's Eve. President Trump is talking about seizing voting machines and making the same demands that had already been shot down by former Attorney General Barr on at least three occasions and by Mr. Rosen and Mr. Donahue on multiple other occasions. Claim after claim knocked down, but the president didn't care. The next day, Chief of Staff Mark Meadows sent a flurry of emails to you, Mr. Rosen, uh, asking that the department look into a new set of allegations. Uh, we're going to put those emails here on the screen. Here we see three requests made on January 1st. One email is a request from Mr. Meadows to you, Mr. Rosen, to send Jeff Clark to Fulton County. Uh, what, did you, what did you do with this request? <clears throat> well, re really, really nothing. Certainly didn't send Mr. Clark to Fulton County, but that email was the first corroboration I had seen uh, of Mr. Clark had told me at that point that the president was considering making the change by Monday, uh, January 4th. So Mr. Meadows' email was something of a corroboration that there were discussions going on that I had been, uh, not been informed about by Mr. Clark or anybody else. Interesting. The second request uh, that you have is to have the Department of Justice lawyers investigate allegations of fraud related to New Mexico. Mr. Rosen, did you have concern about these emails? Y yes, uh, uh, really two concerns about that one. One was that it was coming from a, a campaign or political party, and it was really not our role to function as, as a, a, you know, an arm of any campaign for any party or any campaign. That wasn't our role, uh, and that's part of why I had been unwilling to meet with Mr. Giuliani or any of the, the campaign uh, people before. And the other part was, it was another one of these ones where lots of work had already been done, and I thought it was a rehash of things that had been debunked previously. So the final email here included a completely baseless conspiracy theory that an Italian defense contractor uploaded software to a satellite that switched votes from Trump to Biden. The Select Committee investigation found that this wild, baseless conspiracy theory made it from the recesses of the internet to the highest echelons of our government. On December 31st, Mr. Meadows received this internet conspiracy theory from Representative Perry. On the screen now is the text that Representative Perry sent to Mr. Meadows, copying a YouTube link with the message, quote, why can't we just work with the Italian government? The next day, the president's chief of staff sent the YouTube link to Mr. Rosen, who forwarded it to Mr. Donahue. Mr. Donahue, did you watch this video? I did, Congressman. How long was the video? Approximately 20 minutes. Let's just take a look at a excerpt of that video, if we may. What's being said out of Rome, out of Italy, is that this was done in the U.S. Embassy. That there was a certain State Department guy whose name I don't know uh, yet. I guess this is probably going to come out in Italy at some point. And he was the mastermind, not the mastermind, but the, um, but the, anyway, the guy running the operation of changing the votes. 
and that he was done doing this in conjunction with some support from MI6, the CIA, and this Leonardo group. Mr. Donahue, what was your reaction when you watched that entire 20-minute video? I emailed the acting attorney general, uh, and I said, pure insanity, which was my impression of the video, which was patently absurd. Mr. Rosen, you were asked by Mr. Meadows uh, to meet with Mr. Johnson, who is the person in that video. What was your reaction to that request? <coughs> so, uh, ordinarily, I'd get an email like this, and there was no phone call. It would just, you know, come over the transom. But this one, he, he called me, uh, Mr. Meadows, and asked me to meet with Mr. Johnson. Uh, and I told him this whole thing about Italy had been debunked, and that should be the end of that, and I certainly wasn't going to meet with, with this person. And he initially seemed to accept that. Uh, he, uh, he said, you know, well, why, why won't you meet with him? I said, because if, if he has real evidence, which this video doesn't show, he can walk into an FBI field office anywhere in the United States. There's 55 of them. Uh, and he said, okay. But then he called me, me back uh, a few minutes later and complained and said, um, I didn't tell you, but uh, this, this fellow Johnson is working with Rudy Giuliani, and Mr. Giuliani is really offended that you think they have to go to an FBI field office. That's insulting. So couldn't, couldn't you just have the FBI or, or, or you meet with these guys? And by then I was uh, somewhat agitated uh, and told them that there was no way on earth that I was going to do that. Uh, I wasn't going to meet with Mr. Johnson. I certainly wasn't going to meet with Mr. Giuliani. I'd made that clear repeatedly and said, that's, that's the end of that. You know, don't, don't raise this with me again. And so uh, because Mr. Donahue and I had been in exchanging uh, uh, our views about this, I think it was, yeah, 7.13 on a Friday night of New Year's Day, uh, I had run out of patience, and I sent the, the email that you're, you're talking about where... Uh, <coughs> I, I made pretty clear that I had no interest in doing anything further with this. Just to button this up, Mr. Donahue, did you receive a follow-up call from a Department of Defense official about this conspiracy? I did. I believe it was that same day. Yeah. Can you give a, details on that at all? I received a telephone call from uh, Cash Patel, who I know was a DOD official at that time, worked for, um, I believe, Ac Acting Secretary of Defense Miller. Um, and he didn't know much about it. He basically said, uh, do you know anything about this Italy thing and what this is all about? And I informed him that the chief of staff had raised the issue with us in his office on December 29th, um, that we had looked into it a little bit. We had run the name that was provided to us by the chief of staff. I learned that that individual was in custody in Italy. Um, he had been arrested for a cyber offense of some sort in Italy. The allegation was that he had been exfiltrating data from his company. He was either an, an employee or a contractor of that company, and he was in custody. Um, that the whole thing was very, very murky at best, and the video was absurd. Um, but that we, we, the department, were not going to have anything to do with it. And um, DOD should make up its own mind as to what they're going to do. But. I made it clear to him that I didn't think it was anything worth pursuing. She called the video absurd, and, and despite the absurdity of that conspiracy theory, uh, we learned that Mr. Meadows discussed it frequently in the White House. And Mr. Meadows didn't let the matter go. Uh, the request went from the Department of Justice to the Secretary of Defense, Christopher Miller. As you'll hear, Secretary Miller actually reached out to a high-ranking official based in Italy to follow up on this claim. To ask for him was, can you call out the defense attache realm and find out what the heck's going on because I'm getting all these weird, crazy reports and probably the guy on the ground knows more than anything. The select, select committee confirmed that a call was actually placed by Secretary Miller to the attache in Italy to investigate the claim that Italian satellites were switching votes from Trump to Biden. This is one of the best examples of the lengths to which the pres President Trump would go to stay in power. Scouring the internet to support his conspiracy sh theories shown here, as he told Mr. Donahue in that December 27th call, quote, you guys may not be following the internet the way I do. 
President Trump's efforts to this point had failed. Stonewalled by Mr. Rosen and Mr. Donahue, President Trump had only one option. He needed to make Clark acting attorney general. Mr. Rosen, during a January 2nd meeting with Mr. Clark, did you confront him again about his contact with the president? And if so, can you describe that? <clears throat> so um, at, at this point, Mr. Clark had told us that uh, the president had asked him to consider whether he would be willing to replace me, uh, and supposedly on a timetable by Monday the 4th. And so uh, I had told Mr. Clark I thought he was making a colossal error in judgment, but I also hoped to persuade him uh, to be more rational and to s understood what we had understood, that there's not a factual basis for the fraud assertions that are being made. So at this meeting, Mr. Donahue and I um, met with Mr. Clark, um, and I guess my, my hopes were disappointed in that Mr. Clark continued to express the view that he thought there was uh, fraud, even though he had not been a participant in the department's review of that, and that he was dissatisfied that we knew what we were doing. So, uh, but he had acknowledged that he had had further, I don't know if it was meeting or phone calls or, or what, but further discussion with the president, despite having, you know, a week earlier said that if he, he A, he wouldn't do that, and if he did, he, if he got an invitation to do that, he would let Rich Donahue or me know. So uh, we had a, it was a contentious meeting where we were chastising him that he was insubordinate, he was out of line, he had not honored his own representations of what he would do, and uh, he raised again uh, that he thought that letter uh, should go out, and we were not receptive to that. Can you tell you in that that the president had offered him the job of acting attorney general? That was uh, a day later. On the, on the second, he, he said that the president had asked him to let him know if he'd be willing to take it. Subsequently, he told me that uh, on, the, on Sunday the 3rd, he told me that the timeline had moved up and that the president had offered him the job and that he was accepting it. Well, let's ask about that. What was your reaction to that? Well, uh, you know, on the one hand, I wasn't going to accept being fired by my subordinate, so I wanted to talk to the, the president directly. Um, with regard to uh, the reason for that is I wanted to try to convince the president not to go down the wrong path that Mr. Clark seemed to be advocating. Um, and it wasn't about me. There's only 17 days left in the administration at that point. I would have been perfectly content to have either of the gentlemen on my left or right replace me if, if anybody wanted to do that. But I did not want for the Department of Justice to be put in a posture where it would be doing things that were not consistent with the truth, were not consistent with its own uh, appropriate role, or were not consistent with the Constitution. So I did four things as soon as Mr. Clark left my office on, on that Sunday, the, the third. Number one, I called Mark Meadows and said I need to see the president right away. And he was agreeable and set up a meeting uh, for 6.15 that, that Sunday, so about two hours away. Two, I called Pat Cipollone, the White House counsel, uh, told him what was going on, and he said he would uh, go into the White House to make sure he was at the meeting and he would be supporting the Justice Department's position as he had been doing consistently. Three, I called Steve Engel, who was, uh, I was at the department, it was a Sunday, but there had been some reasons I needed to be there. Mr. Engel, I called at home and asked him if he would come in and go to the meeting, which he did, it had proved to be quite uh, helpful. And then number four, I asked Rich Donahue and Pat Hovakimian, who had uh, previously been my chief of staff, to get the department's senior leadership on a call and let them know what was going on, and, uh, which they did. And then uh, Eric Hirschman called me to tell me that he was going to go to the meeting and that he would be supporting the Department of Justice position as well. So I knew uh, that the meeting was on course and that I would have uh, a number of people supportive of the Department of Justice's approach and not supportive of, of Mr. Clark's approach. Did, did Mr. Clark ask you to continue to stay at the department? 
uh, at that Sunday meeting, uh, when he told me that he would be replacing me, uh, he, he said that he had asked to see me alone, because usually he had met with me and Mr. Donahue, because he thought it would be appropriate in light of what was happening to at least offer me that I could stay on as his deputy. Uh, I thought that was preposterous. Uh, I told him that was n nonsensical and, and that I, there's no universe where I was going to do that, to stay on and support someone else doing things that were not consistent with what I thought should be done. So uh, um, I, I didn't accept that offer, if I can put it that way. <laughs> And during that meeting, did Mr. Clark ask you to sign the Georgia letter? That was on the, the Saturday meeting, uh, January 2nd, that Mr. Donahue and I had with him. Uh, he again raised with both of us that, that he wanted us to, uh, both, to sign that letter, actually. So in that meeting, did Mr. Clark say he would turn down the president's offer if you reversed your position and signed the letter? Yes. Did Mr. Clark, uh, so you still refused to sign and send that letter, I take it? That, that, that's right. Uh, I, I think Mr. Donahue and I were both uh, very consistent that there was no way we were going to sign that letter. And it didn't matter uh, what Mr. Clark's you know, proposition was in terms of, of uh, his own activities. We were not going to sign that letter as long as uh, we were in charge of the Justice Department. Thank you for that, by the way. Mr. Donahue, were you expecting to have to attend a meeting at the White House on, on Sunday, January 3rd? No, um, as the acting AG indicated, uh, we had a meeting that afternoon that related to preparations for January 6th. So I was at the department, but I had no expectation of leaving the department. It was a Sunday afternoon and I was there in civilian clothes um, as we both were and uh, expected to have that meeting, do some other work, but I had no expectation of going to the White House that day. So let's ask, so prior to that Oval Office meeting, did you set up a conference call with senior le leadership at the department? And, and if so, tell us about that call. Yes, so uh, obviously it was a bit of a scramble that afternoon to prepare for the Oval Office meeting. Um, we had discussed on several occasions, the acting attorney general and I, whether we should expand the circle of people who knew what was going on. It was very important that Steve Engel know, and that's why I reached out to Steve on December 28th, because if Mr. Rosen were removed from the seat and the president did not immediately appoint someone else to serve as attorney general, just by function of the department's um, chain of succession, Mr. Engel would be in the seat. We wanted to make sure he knew what was going on should that occur. So the three of us knew. We also brought, brought Pat Hovakimian in, so the four of us knew. But no one else, aside from Jeff Clark, of course, knew what was going on until late that Sunday afternoon. We chose to keep a close hold because we didn't want to create concern or panic in the Justice Department leadership. Um, but at this point, um, I asked the acting AG, what else can I do to help prepare for this meeting at the Oval Office? And he said, you and Pat should get the AAGs on the phone and it's time to let them know what's going on. Let's find out what they may do if there's a change in leadership because that will help inform the conversation at the Oval Office. Pat Hovakimian subsequently set up that meeting. We got most, not all, but most of the AAGs on the phone. We very quickly explained to them what the situation was. Um, I told them, I don't need an answer from you right now. I don't need an answer in this phone call, but if you have an answer, I need it in the next few minutes. So call me, email me, text me, whatever it is, if you know what you would do if Jeff Clark is put in charge of the department. And immediately, Eric Dryben, who was the AAG of the Civil Rights Division, said, I don't need to think about it. There's no way I'm staying. And then the other AAGs began to chime in, uh, in turn, and all essentially said they would leave. They would resign in mass if the president made that change in the department leadership. Incredible. I'd like to look at the assistant attorney generals on the screen. Uh, if we can pull that up, have their pictures. Did every assistant attorney general you spoke to, as you said, agree to resign? Uh, Macon Delrahim uh, was not on the call only because we, we had some difficulty reaching him. But yes, the other people on the um, screen were on the call and all without hesitation said that they would resign. 
So as part of the select committee's investigation, we found that while Mr. Rosen, Mr. Donahue, and Mr. Engel were preparing for their meeting at the White House, Jeff Clark and the president were in constant communication beginning at 7 a.m. White House call logs obtained by the committee show that by 4.19 p.m. on January 3rd, the White House had already begun referring to Mr. Clark as the acting attorney general. As far as the White House was concerned, Mr. Clark was already at the top of the Justice Department. Two hours later, DOJ leadership arrived at the White House. The select committee interviewed every person who was inside the room that was inside the room during this Sunday evening Oval Office meeting. Mr. Cipollone told the committee that he was, quote, unmistakably angry during the meeting and that he, along with Eric Hirschman and Mr. Donahue, quote, forcefully challenged Mr. Clark to produce evidence of his election fraud theories. Mr. Rosen, can you describe how that meeting started? <laughs> yes. So um, after some preliminaries, so we, 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 uh, Mr. Meadows had ushered us all in and then he left. Uh, so Mr. Cipollone did some introductions and things. So after some preliminaries, the president turned to me and he said, well, one thing we know is you, Rosen, you aren't going to do anything. You don't even uh, agree with the, the, the claims of election fraud. And this other guy at least might do something. And then I said, well, Mr. President, you're right that I'm not going to allow the Justice Department to do anything to try to overturn the election. That's true. But the reason for that is because that's what's consistent with the facts and the law, and that's what's uh, required under the Constitution. So that's the right answer and a good thing for the country, and therefore, I submit, it's the right thing for you, Mr. President. And that kicked off uh, another two hours of discussion in which everyone in the room was in one way or another making different points, but uh, supportive of my approach for the Justice Department and critical uh, of Mr. Clark. So at some point, uh, Mr. Donahue comes in the room. Can you explain what led to him coming in the room? Oh, uh, I, I forgot about that. So initially, um, in part, I think, because he was underdressed, we, and we had not arranged, uh, we had not yet told the president that he was going to come in. We, uh, the White House had, had a list of who would be there that did include Mr. Engel and the White House counsel and the deputy White House counsel, Mr. Hirschman. Um, we went in and then we told the president, at, you know, maybe 10 minutes into the meeting or something, I forget how far in, that Mr. Donahue was outside and he said, well, bring him in. And then, and then Mr. Donahue came in and joined the meeting. So, Mr. Donahue, you, you, you enter that room. Can you set the uh, scene for us and describe the tone you walked into? Uh, yes, but if I could just back up one moment, Congressman, because you put the pictures up on the screen of the AAGs. I just want to make clear, one of the AAGs who was not on the screen was John Demers. John was the National Security Division AAG. Um, John was on the call, but I prefaced the call by saying, John, we need you to stay in place. National security is too important. We need to minimize the disruption. Whether you resign is entirely up to you, obviously, and we'll respect your decision either way, but I'm asking you, please stay in place. And he did, so I don't want to uh, leave the impression that he was not willing to resign, Great. because Thank I think for, he was. Thank you for so that. with regard to entering the Oval Office, I was sitting in the hallway, um, uh, an administrative assistant passed by, she asked me, are you supposed to be in this meeting with the president? I said, no, I'm simply here in case questions come up that other people don't have the answer to. And she walked away and then came back probably 30 seconds later, and said the president wants you in the meeting. I proceeded into the Oval Office. I took probably two or three steps in, and I stopped because I was, as the AG said, not exactly properly attired. I was wearing jeans and muddy boots and an Army T-shirt, and I never would arrive in the Oval Office this way. I said, Mr. President, I apologize. I'm sorry. I didn't know I was going to be here. And he said, no, 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 just come in, come in, come in. And so I, I went in. I attempted to take a seat on one of the couches that were behind the chairs or right in front of the president's desk. And he said, oh, no, 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 you're going to be up here. And everyone kind of left. And uh, they moved the chairs a little bit. Someone from the White House Counsel's Office picked up a spare chair and put it directly in front of the president, and I took that seat. Was, it, was there discussion about Mr. Clark? Can you, can you 
kind of enlighten some of what that discussion was? Yes. So the conversation at this point had moved beyond the specific allegations, whether it was State Farm Arena or Antrim County or Pennsylvania or whatever. We had discussed those repeatedly, and the converse, that was backdrop to the conversation. But the conversation at this point was really about whether the president should remove Jeff Rosen and replace him with Jeff Clark. And everyone in the room, I think, understood that that meant that letter would go out. Um, so that was the focus. Uh, it was about a two-and-a-half-hour meeting after I entered, and so there were discussions about the pros and cons of doing that. Um, early on, the president said, what do I have to lose? And it was actually a good opening, because I said, Mr. President, you have a great deal to lose. And I began to explain to him what he had to lose, um, and what the country had to lose, and what the department had to lose. And this was not in anyone's best interest. Um, that conversation went on for some time. Uh, everyone essentially chimed in with their own thoughts, all of which were consistent about how damaging this would be to the country, to the department, to the administration, to him personally. Um, and at some point, the conversation turned to whether Jeff Clark was even qualified, competent to run the Justice Department, which in my mind, he clearly was not. And it was a heated conversation. I thought it was useful to point out to the president that Jeff Clark <clears throat> simply didn't have the, the skills, the ability, and the experience to run the department. And so I said, Mr. President, you're talking about putting a man in that seat who has never tried a criminal case, who's never conducted a criminal investigation. He's telling you that he's going to take charge of the department, 115,000 employees, including the entire FBI, and turn the place on a dime and conduct nationwide criminal investigations that will produce results in a matter of days. It's impossible, it's absurd, it's not going to happen, and it's going to fail. He has never been in front of a trial jury, a grand jury. He's never even been to Chris Ray's office. I said at one point, if you walked into Chris Ray's office, one, would you know how to get there? And two, if you got there, would he even know who you are? Do you really think that the FBI is going to suddenly start following your orders? It's not going to happen. He's not competent. And that's the, the point at which um, Mr. Clark tried to defend himself by saying, well, I've been involved in very significant civil and environmental litigation. I've argued many appeals and appellate courts and things of that nature. And then I <clears throat> pointed out that, yes, he was an environmental lawyer. And, I didn't think that was appropriate background to be running in the, the United States Justice Department. Did anybody in there support Mr. Clark? No one. Mr. Rosen, it was you he was going to replace. So what was your view about the president's plan to appoint Mr. Clark? Well, well, well as I We're going to take to a earlier, pause right now. As some stations will really leave our coverage for local it news. Was, for the rest of you, our it, it coverage would have been fine, continues. As I said, to have had Rich Donahue replace me, I would have said, great, I, I, I get 17 days vacation or something. But uh, the issue was the use of the Justice Department. And it's just so important that the Justice Department uh, adhere to the facts and the law. That's what it's there to do. And that's what uh, our constitutional role was. And so if the Justice Department gets out of the role that it's supposed to play, that's really bad for our country. And I don't know of a simpler way to say that. And when you damage our fundamental institutions, it's not easy to repair them. So I thought uh, this was a really important issue to try to make sure that the Justice Department was able to stay on the right course. Mr. Donahue, did, did you eventually tell the president that mass resignations would occur if he installed Mr. Clark and what the consequences would be? Yes, so this was in line with the president saying, what do I have to lose? Um, and um, along those lines, he said, so suppose I do this. So suppose I replace him, Jeff Rosen, with him, Jeff Clark. What would you do? And I said, Mr. President, I'm going to resign immediately. I'm not working one minute for this guy um, who I had just you know, declared was completely incompetent. And so um, the president immediately turned to, uh, to Mr. Engel, and he said, Steve, you wouldn't resign, would you? And he said, absolutely, I would, Mr. President. You leave me no choice. And, and then I said, and we're not the only ones. No one cares if we resign. If Steve and I go, that's fine. 
It doesn't matter, but I'm telling you what's going to happen. You're going to lose your entire department leadership. Every single AAG will walk out on you. Your entire department leadership will walk out within hours. And I don't know what happens after that. I don't know what the United States attorneys are going to do. We have um, U.S. attorneys in districts across the country, and my guess would be that many of them would have resigned. And that would then have led to resignations across the department in Washington. And I said, Mr. President, within 24, 48, 72 hours, you could have hundreds and hundreds of resignations of the leadership of your entire Justice Department because of your actions. What's that going to say about you? Wow. Mr. Engel, what was, can you describe what your reaction was to that? <clears throat> yeah, no, I, I think when the president, my recollection is that when the president turned to me and said, Steve, you, you wouldn't leave, would you? Uh, I said, Mr. President, uh, I've been with you through four attorneys general, including two acting attorney general, uh, but I couldn't be part of this. Uh, and then the other thing that I said was that, uh, you know, look, I, you know, all anyone is going to sort of think about when they see this, no one is going to read this letter. All anyone is going to think is that you went through two attorneys general in two weeks until you found the environmental guy to sign this thing. And so the story is not going to be that the Department of Justice has found massive corruption that would have changed the result of the election. It's going to be the disaster uh, of Jeff Clark. Uh, and I think at that point, Pat Cipollone said, yeah, this is a murder-suicide pact, this letter. And, and yeah. I, would, I would note, too, Congressman, that uh, it was in this part of the conversation where Steve uh, pointed out that Jeff Clark would be left leading a graveyard. Um, and that, that comment clearly had an impact on the president. The leadership will be gone. Jeff Clark will be left leading a graveyard. Again, the, the premise that, which as Mr. Donahue has said, but that Mr. Clark could come in uh, and take over the Department of Justice and do something different was just an absurd premise. And all he was doing, Mr. Clark, by putting himself forward was uh, blowing himself up. And, you know, if the president were to have gone that course, uh, you know, it would have been a grievous error for the president as well. Mr. Cipollone, the White House counsel, told the committee that Mr. Ingalls' response had a noticeable impact uh, on the president, that this was a turning point uh, in the conversation. Mr. Donahue, towards the end of this meeting, did the president ask you what was going to happen to Mr. Clark? He did. When we finally got to the, I would say, the last 15 minutes of the meeting, the president's decision was apparent. He announced it. Um, Jeff Clark tried to scrape his way back and, and asked the president to reconsider. Um, the president doubled down, said, no, I've made my decision. That's it. We're not going to do it. Um, and then he turned to me and said, so what happens to him now? Uh, meaning Mr. Clark, and he understood that Mr. Clark reported to me. And I, I didn't initially understand the question. I, I said, Mr. President, and he said, are you going to fire him? And I said, I don't have the authority to fire him. He's a Senate-confirmed assistant attorney general. And he said, well, who has the authority to fire him? And I said, only you do, sir. And he said, well, I'm not going to fire him. I said, all right, well, then we should all go back to work. Did you get a call from the president later that night? I did, um, I don't know, probably 90 minutes later or something like that. Well, what was that about? Um, the president, at this, at this point, we left the White House, reconvened at the department. I left the department. I was back in my apartment. My cell phone rang. It was the president, and he had information about a truck supposedly full of shredded ballots in Georgia that was in the custody of an ICE agent whose name he had. I told him that ICE was part of Department of Homeland Security. Um, I had heard about this. If Department of Homeland Security needed our assistance, we, of course, would provide it. Uh, but it was really up to DHS to make a call if their agent was involved. And he said, fine, I understand. Can you just make sure that Ken, meaning Ken Cuccinelli, knows about this? I said, fine, I would pass that along to him. I eventually contacted Ken Cuccinelli later that evening, and I said, this is what the president told me. If you guys have anything you think should be brought to our attention, let me know. And he said, thank you, and that was it. Mr. Cipollone left the meeting, convinced the president would not appoint Mr. Clark, uh, but he didn't think the president had actually accepted the truth about the election. Sure enough, all the same debunked theories appeared in his speech at the Ellipse three days later. 
In the state of Arizona, over 36,000 ballots were illegally cast by non-citizens. 11,600 more ballots and votes were counted, more than there were actual voters. You see that? In Wisconsin, corrupt Democrat-run cities deployed more than 500 illegal, unmanned, unsecured drop boxes, which collected a minimum of 91,000 unlawful votes. Mr. Donahue, Mr. Rosen, Mr. Engel, and others stopped President Trump's efforts, at least temporarily. Yet the message President Trump and his Republican allies pushed throughout December made its way to his supporters anyway. And they kept up the pressure campaign on the way to storming the Capitol on January 6th. Mr. Rosen, were you at the Department of Justice on January 6th? Yes, I was there all day. Once the Capitol was under attack, I understand that you communicated with fellow cabinet members and Capitol Hill leadership. Can you tell us who you spoke to? Yeah, I was basically on the phone virtually nonstop all day. Some calls with our own DOJ folks, some with cabinet counterparts uh, at DHS and, and uh, Defense and the Interior, some with senior White House officials and with a number of congressional leaders. Uh, uh, I received calls from Speaker Pelosi, from uh, Leader McCarthy, from um, uh, Leader Schumer, I believe um, Leader McConnell's chief of staff called uh, a number of other members of Congress uh, as well. And the, you know, the basic thrust of the calls with the members of Congress was there's a you know, dire situation here and, and can you help? And I reported to them that we were on a very urgent basis sending help from the department. Uh, we, we wound up sending over 500 agents and officers from uh, FBI, ATF, and the U.S. Marshals to assist with uh, restoring order at the Capitol. So I uh, had a number of calls. As I say, it was more or less nonstop all afternoon. Did you speak to the vice president that day? Uh, yes, twice. The, Did no, please, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, the, the first call was a one-on-one -on -one discussion, somewhat akin to the congressional leadership calls, uh, up updating him on what we were doing to assist. And the, uh, the second call was a conference call around 7 o'clock with the vice president, congressional leaders, senior White House staff, some other cabinet officials, uh, to address that order appeared to be close to being restored, or restored, but security still being determined. And the question being, what time could the Congress reassemble? And uh, uh, the answer was 8 o'clock, and thankfully, Congress did reassemble and complete its constitutional duty. There was one highlight of that second call with the Vice President, which is Mr. Donahue had gone to the rotunda of the Capitol to be able to give firsthand account and was able to tell the, the uh, folks on the call, including the Vice President, that uh, we thought 8 o'clock would work. Did you speak to the president on January 6th? No, I spoke to a number of senior White House officials, but uh, not the president. Mr. Donahue, on January 6th, uh, we know uh, from Mr. Rosen that you helped uh, in the effort to reconvene joint session, the joint session, is that correct? Yes, sir. We see here in a video that we're gonna play now, uh, you arriving with your security detail. Uh, to help secure the Capitol. Mr. Donahue, 30 minutes after you arrived at the Capitol, did you lead a briefing for the Vice President? Uh, I'm not sure exactly what the time frame was, but uh, I did participate in the call and participate in briefing the Vice President as well as the Congressional leadership that night, yes. And where'd you conduct that call at? I was in an office. Um, I'm not entirely sure where it was. My detail found it because of the acoustics in the rotunda were such that it wasn't really conductive to having a call. So they found an office. We went to that office, and I believe I participated in two phone calls, one at 1800 and one at 1900 that night from that office. Uh, what time did you actually end up leaving the Capitol? I waited until um, the Senate was back in session, which I believe they were gaveled in a few minutes after um, 8 p.m. And once they were back in session and we were confident that the entire facility was secured and cleared, that there were no individuals hiding in closets or under desks, that there were no IEDs or other suspicious devices left behind. Um, I left minutes later. I was probably gone by 8.30.
And Mr. Donahue, did you ever hear from President Trump that day? No. Uh, like the AAG, the acting AG, I spoke to Pat Cipollone and uh, Mark Meadows and the vice president and the congressional leadership, but I never spoke to the president that day. So in today's hearing, we've showcased the efforts of the Americans before us to stand up for democracy. Mr. Rosen, Mr. Donahue stayed steadfastly committed to the oath they take as officials in the Department of Justice. On January 6 itself, they assisted during the attack while our Commander-in-Chief stayed silent. Their bravery is a high moment in the sordid story of what led to January 6. My colleagues and I up here also take an oath. Some of them failed to uphold theirs and instead chose to spread the big lie. Days after the tragic events of January 6, some of these same Republican members requested pardons in the waning days of the Trump administration. Five days after the attack on the Capitol, Representative Mo Brooks sent the email on the screen now. As you see, he emailed the White House, quote, pursuant to a request from Matt Gates, requesting a pardon for Representative Gates himself and unnamed others. Witnesses told the select committee that the president considered offering pardons to a wide range of individuals connected to the president. Let's listen to some of that testimony. And was Representative Gates requesting a pardon? Believe so. The, the general tone was we may get prosecuted because we were defensive of you know, the president's positions on these things. The pardon that he was discussing, requesting, was as broad as you could describe from the beginning, of, I remember he's from the beginning of time up until today, for any and all things. I think he mentioned Nixon, and I said Nixon's pardon was never nearly that broad. And are you aware of any members of Congress seeking pardons? I guess Mr. Gates and Mr. Brooks, I know, have both advocated for there to be a blanket pardon for members involved in that meeting and a handful of other members that weren't at the December 21st meeting um, as the preemptive pardons. Uh, Mr. Gates was personally pushing for a pardon, and he was doing so since early December. I'm not sure why. Uh, Mr. Gates had reached out to me to ask if he could have a meeting with Mr. Meadows about receiving a presidential pardon. Did they all contact you? Not all of them, but several of them did. So you mentioned Mr. Gates, Mr. Brooks. Um, Mr. Biggs did. Mr. Jordan talked about congressional pardons, but he never asked me for one. It's more for an update on whether the White House is going to pardon members of Congress. Mr. Gomer asked for one as well. Any Mr. Perry asked for a pardon too. I'm sorry, I need to finish. Mr. Perry, did he talk to you directly? Yes, he did. Did uh, Marjorie Taylor Reed contact you? No, she didn't contact me about it. I heard that she had asked White House Counsel Office for a pardon from Mr. Philbin, but. I didn't frequently communicate with Ms. Green. Are you aware of any conversations or communications regarding the possibility of giving Congressman Matt Gates a pardon? Um, I know he had asked for it, but I don't know if he ever received one or what happened with it. How do you know that Congressman Gates asked for a pardon? He told me. Uh, tell us about that. He told me he'd asked Meadows for a pardon. Were you involved in or did you witness any conversations about the possibility of a blanket pardon for everyone involved in January 6th? Uh, I heard that mentioned, yeah. Do you know whether the president had any conversations about potentially pardoning any uh, family members? Um, I know he had hinted at a blanket pardon for the January 6th thing for anybody, um, but I think he had for all the staff and everyone involved, not with January 6th, but just before he left office, I know he had talked about that. The only reason I know to ask for a pardon 
is because you think you've committed a crime. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. I want to thank our witnesses for joining us today. The members of the select committee may have additional questions for today's witnesses, and we ask that you respond expeditiously in writing to these questions. Without objection, members will be permitted 10 business days to submit statements for the record, including opening remarks and additional questions for the witnesses. Without objection, the chair recognizes the gentleman from Illinois for a closing statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The Justice Department lawyers are not the president's personal lawyers. We count on them to be on the side of the law and to defend the best interest of the United States, not the best interest of any political campaign. That's how it's been since the department was founded soon after the Civil War. Justice Department lawyers are supposed to play it 100% straight. President Trump tried to erase his loss at the ballot box by parachuting an unqualified man into the top job at justice. It was a power play to win at all costs with no regard for the will of the American people. It was about ignoring millions of votes. Ignore them, throw them out, label them fraudulent, corrupt, illegal, whatever. Facts were clearly just an inconvenience. From the Oval Office, President Trump urged others to bring his big lie to life. He begged, just say the election was corrupt and leave the rest to me and the Republican congressman. He didn't care what the department's investigations proved. What good were facts when they would only confirm his loss? And it's no surprise that all the far out, fully fabricated, whack job conspiracy theories collapsed under even the slightest scrutiny. That insanity went from the internet to the highest levels of government in no time. The bottom line, the most senior leadership of the Justice Department, from Attorney General Bill Barr to Jeff Rosen, his successor and his deputy, Rich Donahue, everyone except Jeff Clark, was telling President Trump the very same thing. The conspiracy theories were false. The allegation of a stolen election was a lie. The data left no room for doubt, nothing to question. And the Constitution left no room for President Trump to change the outcome of the election. But we're here today because the facts were irrelevant to President Trump. It was about protecting his very real power and very fragile ego, even if it required recklessly undermining our, ent our entire electoral system by wildly casting baseless doubt upon it. In short, he was willing to sacrifice our republic to prolong his presidency. I can imagine no more dishonorable act by a president. We owe a great debt of gratitude to these men you've heard from here today. Real leaders who stood for justice when it was in grave peril, who put their country first when the leader of the free world demanded otherwise. They threatened to resign rather than corrupt our democracy. And thanks largely to each of them, President Trump's coup failed. Contrast that to Jeff Clark, who would do exactly what the president wanted. Say there was massive fraud, forget the facts, and leave the rest to President Trump's congressional friends. Mr. Clark refused to cooperate with this committee. He pled the fifth over 125 times. Why risk self-incrimination? -in and President Trump's congressional friends, some of them are angling for pardons. They knew that every bit of what they did was a lie and it was wrong. That's all the more reason to respect those who came here to testify today. We thank them for their unflinching service in the face of incredible pressure. As it said, the only thing necessary for evil to succeed is good men to do nothing. Thankfully, there were good people in the Department of Justice. You heard from other good people, too, on Tuesday. They, too, defended us. But I'm still worried that not enough has changed to prevent this from happening again. The oath that we take has to mean something. It has to cut to the core of who we are and be the driving force of our service to this nation. We on this committee... We may be able to shine light on the darkness, 
But that is not enough. It's now up to every American, now and in the future, to stand for truth, to reject the lies wherever we confront them, in our towns, in our capitals, in our friendships, in our families, and at the ballot box, and within our own minds and hearts. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Without objection, the chair recognizes the gentlewoman from Wyoming, Ms. Cheney, for a closing statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And, and I, again, want to thank the witnesses for being here today. Uh, after today, I suspect that uh, there will be some who label you agents of the deep state or something else conspiratorial or nonsensical, uh, meant to justify ignoring what you've said today, uh, ignoring the facts. That may be uh, the short-term cost of acting honorably and telling the truth, but your actions should have an important long-term impact. They will help keep us on the course set by the framers of our Constitution. Let me paraphrase the words of John Adams and others. Whether ours shall continue to be a government of laws and not of men is ultimately for the American people to decide. And let me also today make a broader statement to millions of Americans who put their trust in Donald Trump. In these hearings so far, you've heard from more than a dozen Republicans who've told you what actually happened in the weeks before January 6th. You will hear from more in the hearings to come. Several of them served Donald Trump and his administration, others in his campaign. Others have been conservative Republicans for their entire careers. It can be difficult to accept that President Trump abused your trust, that he deceived you. Many will invent excuses to ignore that fact. But that is a fact. I wish it weren't true, but it is. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Again, I thank our witnesses and thank my colleagues for this hearing. As we conclude our fifth hearing in this series, I want to remind the American people of a few things the committee has shown. Donald Trump lost the 2020 election. Top Republican officials who supported Trump knew that he lost and told him he lost. Trump knew he lost. Those who say the election was affected by widespread voter fraud are lying. They were lying in 2020, they were lying in 2021, and indeed, they are lying today. Donald Trump went to court. That's the right any candidate seeking to challenge the outcome of an election must do. Donald Trump lost in court dozens and dozens of times. He lost in part because there was no evidence that voter fraud had any impact on the results of the election. To borrow a phrase from our witness earlier this week, Mr. Bowers, all he had was theories and no evidence. As I've said, if you're running for office in the United States, that's the end of the line. You accept the court's judgment, you concede the race, you respect the rule of law, and the will of the voters. But for Donald Trump, that wasn't the end of the line, not even close. The voters refused to keep him in office. The courts refused to keep him in office, but he continued to lie. And he went in search of anyone who would go along with his scheme. And we've shown today, he pressured the Justice Department to act as an arm of his re-election campaign. He hoped law enforcement officials would give the appearance of legitimacy to his lies. So he and his allies had some veneer of credibility when they told the country that the election was stolen. Earlier this week, we showed how Donald Trump brought the weight of the presidency down on local and state officials who are trying to do their jobs, and ultimately did. They investigated his claims and found them to be false. And then they endured Trump's pressure campaign at great risk to themselves and their loved ones. And of course, 
There was a scheme to get the former vice president, Mike Pence, to violate the law and the Constitution by rejecting the Electoral College votes on January 6th and blocking the peaceful transfer of power. I mentioned the former vice president last because, as we showed, when he refused to bow to the pressure in those critical moments on January 6th, there was a backup plan for stopping the transfer of power, the mob and their vile threats. Up to this point, we've shown the inner workings of what was essentially a political coup, an attempt to use the powers of the government from the local level all the way up to overturn the results of the election, find me the votes, send fake electors, just say the election was corrupt. Along the way, we saw threats of violence. We saw what some people were willing to do. In the service of the nation, the Constitution, no. In service of Donald Trump. When the Select Committee continues this series of hearings, we're going to show how Donald Trump tapped into the threat of violence, how he summoned the mob to Washington, and how, after corruption and political pressure failed to keep Donald Trump in office, violence became the last option. Our investigation is ongoing. Those hearings have spurred an influx of new information that the committee and our investigators are working to assess. We are committed to presenting the American people with the most complete information possible. That will be our aim when we reconvene in the coming weeks. The chair, however, requests those in the hearing room remain seated until the Capitol Police have escorted members from the room. Without objection, the committee stands adjourned. As the hearings come to a close for today, the focus of today squarely on how President Trump unsuccessfully tried to get the Department of Justice to declare the 2020 election corrupt. Today's witnesses testify that a former DOJ attorney named Jeff Clark was aligned with the former president in a bid to overturn the election, in part by trying to replace staff at the top of the department. Finally, witnesses today described an Oval Office meeting with an agitated President Trump who wanted DOJ leadership to seize voting machines from state governments, a request they refused. I'm back now with Chuck Todd, NBC's political director and moderator of Meet the Press. Uh, assess what we heard today and, and where this leads us uh, in, this, in this journey. Well, look, I think today is the best example, and, and we were talking earlier with Danny, that this, is a, this was a multifaceted operation to overturn this election. And what I think the committee has done a terrific job of doing is sort of laying out that these individual acts were connected, but they were also distinct. So, you know, the courts were the first place, and then he was pressuring state officials, and then he realized that wasn't working, so he had to get the federal government involved, and he thought, well, if the Justice Department can just say they're investigating, I'll take care of the rest, right? He needed, he wanted the, uh, some sort of legitimacy from that. And then what I think, you know, the word coup has been thrown around, I think, too much, but today's hearing is, the is I think, where we come closest to where I understand why people want to use that C word here. Because that meeting in the Oval Office, where essentially those Justice Department officials talked the president out of orchestrating a coup, that was the, that is the most, the closest we came to, to him almost beginning the orchestration of it. Because if he switches out Clark, that goes out, gives some legitimacy there. You see probably more Republicans in Congress suddenly deciding to do this. And who knows what we would have done with Pence. But, you know, Benny Thompson's close there at the end, I think, was very important because you now see why they believe the violence should be um, directly, that the president should be directly held accountable. They view it as the last resort. <clears throat> and in each one of these things, they couldn't get the Justice Department. Then what happened in the last 48 hours? The pressure campaign on Pence. Then what Benny Thompson is alleging, when that failed, well, what's the truly last resort? See if you can totally disrupt the process and just prevent it from happening. So, I, look, I thought today's is the most chilling 
when you go through the details because today is the one day where I think it is appropriate to say he tried to orchestrate a coup. And I think today was where you saw where it almost became operational. Well, somebody points along these hearings, the, the ultimate mm -hmm. question, what if? What if this there was a part lot of, of it had, had, had and, succeeded? And he, he basically, you know, it's funny. Trump has the ability to, 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 to sort of see some clarity. When, when Mr. Engel described to him, you realize everybody's going to leave. And, he, and Trump, Trump knew that if the DOJ resigns en masse, Senate Republicans probably all bail on him and, Matt, and it, you know, it ends up totally, you know, uh, screwing up his entire scheme. Let me get over to uh, Ken Delanian right now. He's NBC, NBC News national security correspondent. Ken, uh, what are your thoughts after today's testimony? Lester, I always watch these hearings wondering what the people in this building behind me are thinking and getting from it, whether they're seeing evidence of crimes to prosecute. And I think today we certainly saw some of that. The letter to the Georgia legislature that Donald Trump and the people around him, some of the people, were trying to get the Justice Department to send was a fraud. And it was a dagger aimed at the heart of our democracy. And as Jeffrey Rosen said, if it had been sent, it would have caused civil unrest. Millions of people would have believed it. And, and, and the, the possibilities are we wouldn't want to consider what would happen had that letter been sent. It was a lie. But then the next question becomes, did Donald Trump know it was a lie? Is there evidence he knew it was a lie? And that's where I think we, we got into some murky territory today. You didn't hear any of those witnesses say Donald Trump told us he knew he lost the election, but he was putting forth these theories anyway. What they said was he was adamant. He kept coming back with new conspiracy theories from the Internet. And that is the dilemma, because in order to prosecute the former president, the Justice Department needs evidence of criminal intent. And, and they have to prove that in court. And the same would go for... Uh, for Mr. Rosen, who's uh, for, for Jeffrey Clark, whose home was searched today by federal agents. Criminal intent is a key issue for any prosecution, and the evidence on that seems to remain murky, Lester. Okay, Ken, thank you. Washington correspondent Yamish Alcindor is with us as well. Uh, Yamish, what stood out for you? What stood out for me was this dramatic meeting at the White House that really comes down to what you were just talking about, which is what if. It really brings how close this nation came to a completely different ending and to former President Trump succeeding in his attempt to hold on to power unlawfully. Um, I was struck by the fact that the committee brought out new evidence. We saw White House call logs that were already calling Jeffrey Clark the acting AG. That, in some ways, really does get at exactly how close former President Trump came to installing what is someone who what is someone who is really an environmental lawyer who is way out of his league, according to his bosses, and who is still obsessed with the with overturning the election in the way that former President Trump was. I'm also um, stressed, what also stood out to me was this idea, and I was texting with an ethics lawyer that the government was, in some ways, this the source told me it stopped functioning for the will of the American people. It stopped functioning as being a representative for the American people in the middle of a pandemic, in the middle of all of the different things that are going on. And instead, you have all these arms of the government focused on trying to find a way to overturn the 2020 election. And I have to tell you, that list of lawmakers, that 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 uh, aid to Mark Meadows under oath is saying acts for pardons is something that we are absolutely going to have to watch. It's Marjorie Taylor Greene, Matt Gates, Louis Gormert. These names being put out there publicly really tells us that this is this was someone um, this was a scheme that really was getting to the heart of the Republican Party and these lawmakers knew that they were potentially criminal liable criminally liable for something it's also striking that those are the same lawmakers that are continuing to lie about the 2020 election who are on the campaign trail continuing to spread all of these false claims about the election being stolen or being rigged that tells you that even after January 6th and even after they were asking the White House for pardons, they are still out there doing this. Um, and you, of course, have at least someone like Scott Perry who is saying that that's a lie. But he's saying that when he's not under oath. <laughs> that le young lady that we saw, Cassidy Hutchinson, an aide to Mark Meadows, the former chief of staff, she is under oath saying this. So it is really striking to me that she was name-checking members of the Republican Party. Um, and, of course, Chuck said... Betty Thompson talking about the teaser to come next, how we get to the violence. That is something to watch out for. Yeah, the pardon business kind of dropped late in, in today's hearing. Let me bring in NBC News legal analyst and criminal defense attorney Danny Savalas. Talk, if you can, a little bit about folks seeking pardons. What, what do you read into that uh, what, and what the 
the legal exposure is, if any. The group pardon has precedent. Washington pardoned members of the Whiskey Rebellion, and Gerald Ford pardoned draft dodgers in Vietnam. But the real interesting legal question is, requesting a pardon evidence of consciousness of guilt? Or is it evidence that, hey, I don't believe I did anything wrong, and that's why I deserve a pardon? An interesting legal and ethical question. But they do a good job of tying that from, from the, the bulk of the testimony today about the, the, the letter and all that. Did they do a good job of making that connect? You know, it's interesting you say that because I think the details of the letter, I understand why you're asking that. I think that that is, it's sort of like, I think people are not fully appreciating the power of the Department of Justice letterhead, right? That that would have been, it, it's, it's less the substance of the letter and more the action that they actually put the letter out, right? That is what that would have, and I, and I, so I understand why you're asking the question, and I think that that, they tried to, do, you know, I, 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 look, if you're paying close attention, I think you can see it, but I think that is hard to, to truly visualize. I mean, you know, oh my God, the Justice Department's investigating the election? I mean, look, if you're not following at this at the whole time, suddenly if you were, I don't know if there's anything to this, that might make a lot of people think there is something to it. I mean, it would have been a powerful, uh, uh, operation if they pulled that off, and it, and, it, and it could have plunged us into a constitutional crisis. All right, Chuck, thank you. That's going to conclude our coverage. I'll have much more coming up here on the NBC Nightly News for now. Lester Holt in New York, thank you for watching, everyone. I'm Hallie, and we're coming on the air right now after a big and busy day of breaking news with a not, lot of new details we're getting from three senior Trump-appointed Justice Department officials. You heard some of it if you've been watching our coverage, if you've been watching that hearing, testifying live to the country about this push by former President Trump to try to put a loyalist in charge of the Department of Justice. Somebody was sympathetic to his lies about the election, trying to falsely overturn those 2020 election results in several states based on some debunked conspiracy theories. So a few buckets we're going to talk about here. Let's break this into our biggest takeaways as we have just wrapped this hearing and we head into the next phase of this communication from the select committee. First, right, you've got kind of a tale of two Jeffreys here. First, Jeffrey Rosen, the acting attorney general at one point. He only served for about a month. He took over for Bill Barr at the end of December 2020. He accepted what the DOJ had determined, that there was no evidence of widespread fraud that would have influenced the election. On the other hand, you have this other Jeffrey, Jeffrey Clark, a character that was very present, if not physically, then at least in the conversation here in the hearing today. This is the person that Donald Trump wanted to replace Rosen with. And if you want to know what some people thought of Clark's qualifications, this is how former White House attorney Eric Hirschman summed them up. Watch. And when he finished discussing what he planned on doing, I said, good. Excuse me, sorry, a hole. Congratulations, you just admitted a first step or act you take as attorney general would be committing a felony and violating Rule 6C. You're clearly the right candidate for this job. Okay, that is sarcasm, in case you didn't catch that. And that soundbite that you just listened to is really important because it draws a link between Jeffrey Clark, remember, somebody who Donald Trump wanted to take over the DOJ, with the knowledge from another attorney that what he was trying to do was illegal, was a felony. That's important. Tuck that away here, okay? By the way, we just found out that Clark yesterday got a visit from federal law enforcement officials. We'll talk about that in a second. So keep in mind that if Clark had taken over the Department of Justice, that could have given legitimacy to these totally made-up lies about election fraud. And if he got that job, then the committee, you could have seen, actually, false letters to six states that President Biden won, the Department of Justice would have sent, to withdraw their results, again, based on this conspiracy. Those letters actually got drafted. We saw them. And according to Acting Deputy Attorney General Richard Donahue, so this is another person who testified today, Clark was basically conducting this shadow investigation. He was calling his own witnesses. He was trying to get a national intelligence briefing, for example, on some of these lies. And Donahue was very clear that he told the former president these claims had absolutely no merit. I felt that being very blunt in that conversation might help make it clear to the president that these allegations were simply not true. As the president went through them, I went piece by piece to say, no, that's false. That is not true. 
Okay, so that's another bucket takeaway here, right? Bucket two, which is that Donald Trump was told by DOJ officials that these conspiracy theories that he was taking action on were not true. But keep in mind, look at this. Jeffrey Clark's influence was so big at this point. We found out the White House call logs already showed him as the acting attorney general on January 3rd, three days before the insurrection. He never had that job. That was never a job that Clark actually had. But this is the way that Donald Trump wanted it to go. Another important takeaway that we learned today, the committee is sharing, confirming now publicly for the first time that it did speak with former Trump White House counsel Pat Cipollone. Remember, this is somebody who Congresswoman Liz Cheney said the other day they want to hear from in a formal deposition setting. The committee now says they've heard from him informally, and they talked about some of what they learned from Cipollone. Remember, White House counsel, he was in all these meetings, he has knowledge of these conversations and of what Donald Trump knew when. Donahue says he was told by Cipollone, rather, that this letter drafted by Clark was basically a murder-suicide pact. That's what he told the president, because so many people in the Department of Justice would resign if Jeffrey Clark ended up taking over. Donahue also turned over, by the way, a bunch of information, a bunch of notes from calls that he had with former President Trump, with others, saying various things, including, for example, that he knew um, that, that former President Trump wanted to put Jeffrey Clark in place, was talking about some of these conspiracy theories. So let's get right to it. I want to bring in some of our team who is standing by out in the field and here in 30 Rock, Ali Rafa, who is live on Capitol Hill. Harry Lippman is with us, too, our legal analyst. Ken Delanian, outside the Department of Justice as well. And in a minute, we're going to bring in Chuck Todd for some more analysis. Ali, let me start with you. And reaction that we're getting now that this hearing is over, I understand Congressman Kinzinger is going to speak to reporters. If it didn't already happen, I expect it will happen momentarily. What's been the takeaway uh, just in the last couple of minutes since this hearing has wrapped up on the Hill? Well, I think the biggest takeaway from this latest hearing, Hallie, was really this presidential pardon nugget. And that's what we're specifically noticing some reaction coming in. As a matter of fact, already uh, Congressman Mo Brooks, who has been uh, actually subpoenaed by the committee actually, after being asked to voluntarily testify and provide information as far as his role in January 6th, we learned that he was among several GOP congressmen uh, who asked for, uh, President Trump for a presidential pardon for their role in January. 6. Among those others are Matt Gates, Mo Brooks, uh, Andy Biggs, Louis Gohmert. And so we also learned more about Pennsylvania Congressman Scott Perry, who the committee really laid out uh, was the reason for Clark being brought into uh, the White House, this Trump loyalist who, uh, who former President Trump wanted to replace Rosen with at the top of the DOJ, this institution that for decades has uh, made it a point to try and distance themselves as an independent entity from the executive branch, from the presidential office, even though it is in the executive branch. And uh, like the committee laid out, Trump really wanted the DOJ to do his bidding. And the committee really going into how former President Trump even said, uh, quote, leave it to me and these Republican congressmen really using them as a vessel here to, to do his bidding again, Allie. Allie, thank you. Harry Lemon, let me bring you in here because there's a couple of questions that I have for you from the legal perspective. First of all, one of the revelations from this hearing today, this is really another big bucket, another big takeaway. It happened right at the end, so let me tell folks about it, is this idea that members of Congress, some of them, some of these Republicans, as Allie mentioned, were looking for pardons. So Matt Gates, Mo Brooks, Marjorie Taylor Greene, according to some of the testimony there. Jim Jordan never specifically asked for one, but alluded to the idea of pardons. We're now hearing from Congressman Brooks, and I want to, just looking at my email because it has just come in, and Allie well knows this from her work on the Hill team, that Mo Brooks has said he would appear in front of the January 6th committee if that deposition was shown publicly and could be public. Um, help us understand why it is so significant that you have some of these members of Congress who are involved in this scheme that are now asking, that had been at the time, asking to be pardoned that we're now learning about. So look, there is some issue of saying you ask for a pardon, you've got some criminal consciousness of guilt. And that is part of it. But the big thing that happened today was this conspiracy, which we knew only in a top line way, it was, was shown to be so sprawling and involving so many others. So I think the really big thing about these five members is what they were doing that caused them to say, I want a part in here. And, and as you say, five, and starting with Matt Gates. So it's the conduct and the way in which Scott Perry, we, we know about specifically, mm -hmm. the actual plan 
has them deeply involved in trying to do what is plainly a crime, that is to say, a fraud on the United States to overthrow the election. You bring up Scott Perry, and just so people yeah. understand here, he is somebody who made that connection between Jeffrey Clark, this DOJ official, and chief of staff at the time, Mark Meadows, which obviously got him into former President Trump's orbit here. His office has previously called it a soulless lie that Perry ever asked for a pardon. We anticipate we'll see more threads from this from the committee. But I also want to ask you about Clark specifically, because yeah. this is somebody who was, con after being told by his boss at the time at the Department of Justice, technically still his boss, Jeffrey Rosen, that he was sort of out of line here. He continued to make calls to people. He asked for a briefing from intelligence officials. Does Jeffrey Clark, in your view, have any legal liability, Harry? Oh, yeah, big time. And I think he's also made to order as a potential cooperating witness. You got to understand, Jeffrey Clark is essentially a non entity. He, on the flow chart, doesn't really go very high. He's just someone, you know, Trump is any port in a storm. He latches onto him through Perry, specifically because Clark agrees, because of his ambition, to let himself be used in this lie. And I just want to say, as a former DOJ person, Hallie, this one left me completely breathless because wow. it got so close. Everywhere else, we, you know, Trump is sprawling around doing whatever he can. This was the width of a paper. That paper goes out, people in Georgia and six other states say, DOJ thinks it, maybe there's a problem. And you can really see how the dominoes at that point would have fallen and would have left Trump potentially in power. I take your point to the fragility of the dominoes, if you will, yeah. Harry. We saw Jeff Rosen and Rich Donahue pulling basically all the fire alarms, convening a call with then the next level of Department of Justice officials to basically take a roll call and say, hey, if I jump, you jump, right? And they all agreed that they were out if Jeff Clark came into place. Ken, talk a little bit more about that, what you're hearing from the DOJ. And I think critically, this piece of news that we got today, that just 24 hours ago, roughly, federal authorities were at Clark's house. Tell us more. That's right, Hallie. Um, according to a witness who is uh, uh, Jeff uh, Clark's boss, it was actually they conducted a search. They took him out of his house in his pajamas and seized his electronic devices, which suggests they had a search warrant, which means would mean they convinced the judge there was probable cause to believe a crime had been committed. And usually they do that when they believe a witness is trying to hide evidence when not or not submitting documents in response to a subpoena. But look, I, I completely agree with Harry. That hearing today was breathtaking because of how close we came to an absolute disaster. The letter to uh, the Georgia legislature that, that was the whole purpose of this conspiracy that Trump wanted the DOJ to send out, essentially saying that they had found fraud when, in fact, they had not found fraud. That letter was a dagger aimed at the heart of our democracy. And had it gone out, there, there likely would have been civil unrest that made January 6th look like a picnic. Um, and, and the only reason it didn't happen is because courageous people, many of them appointed by Donald Trump, stood up and said, we're not doing this. We're not, we want no part of this. And we will resign if you try to uh, appoint this guy and make him attorney general. Um, I'm standing in front of the Department of Justice. I always watch these hearings with an eye towards what are, what are the prosecutors getting out of this? If they ever do bring a case against Donald Trump, and we're a long way from that, a lot of the testimony and evidence we heard in this hearing will be a big part of it. But one thing the hearing did not solve today is the question of whether, whether Donald Trump had criminal intent. Because what we never heard from any of those witnesses today, Hallie, was anybody saying Donald Trump knew he was lying. He told us he knew he lost the election, but he wanted to assert these claims of fraud anyway. That's going to be a key piece of evidence if they ever decide to bring a case against Donald Trump. Kendall Annie and Harry Lippman, Ali Rafa, thank you. Let me bring in Chuck Todd now, who I've had the pleasure of spending the last four hours of our lives with together, Chuck, <laughs> yeah. as we watch this hearing unfold. I know that one of your big takeaways is something we've heard reflected from both Harry and Ken, which is the, the, the sheer scope of what yeah. we saw unfold as it related to this pressure campaign on the DOJ, the former president's push to try to install basically a loyalist at the top. For people who may be going, wait a second, Hallie, like, you have a million names. You're talking about a lot of people. Like, give me, what do I need to know coming out of this hearing? What would you tell those folks? Look, today was the day that you learned how operational this, you know, what the, what the president was actually trying to do. He was trying to create uh, legitimacy to his allegations. And, you know, when you start to see the, and you said that people have been making, that this really was a multifaceted attempt, and there, and there really is structure to it, right? They started at the courts. They tried with the states, 
and then they realized they needed cover, and the Justice Department was the best place to get cover, right? They couldn't get the FBI operational or, or, or U.S. Attorney's operational without the legitimacy from the Justice Department. It's pretty clear that Bill, Bill Barr didn't want to be a part of this, which may be why he walked. Uh, uh, and then all of a sudden, we're, we're in this situation where the president— uh, how you know they they ended up with a, a a loyalist from the White House Counsel's Office found their way to the Justice Department. The congressman Scott Perry, who seemed to be intricately involved, it's like the president had his own sort of team trying to maneuver around folks like Mr. Rosen, mm. the acting attorney general, in order to try to get what he wanted. And I guess the way I would describe it, today's hearing's the closest, and I said this earlier, which is, I think the C word has gotten thrown around too much, the coup, the word coup. But today's the day where there, we were right at an operational moment. You know, had, had in that meeting, President Trump decided, nope, I'm firing you guys, you're out. But He's the acting attorney general. And then that letter goes out. And while the letter itself, it, it, people will, will get convoluted, it's the letter head. Because the you know what the headline would have been in all over the news, the Justice Department right, right, right. has Says, weighed in, yes. and that would have had an impact. It would have created phony legitimacy to this, uh, would have gotten more people comfortable, perhaps in Congress, carrying the president's water here. It would have it would have absolutely immediately created a constitutional crisis. But this is where Rosen and Donahue deserve a ton of credit and Engel, because they didn't just tell them they'd resign. They organized, they made sure they had that department ready to be, ready to go. And you and I both know President Trump well enough. He's savvy enough to understand what that would have looked like that, at the that moment. That. That's right. What I'm so, it, so go ahead. I was just going to say, Chuck, what I'm so struck by, because you bring up Mr. Engel, it's not even like this, this meeting is hours and hours. And again, you have interviewed Donald Trump. I used to cover him. You know, things mm -hmm. can go on for a long time in a freewheeling way. Always with him. It was like one comment. According to the testimony today from Mr. Engel, this idea that it would be a graveyard at the DOJ. You heard the people testify, Donahue and um, and Rosen, that it was that comment that changed the game. That at that point, mm -hmm. Donald Trump seemed to be deeply affected by that. And I'm so struck by the thought of what if Steve Engel didn't ever make that comment, right? What if that point right. wasn't made and struck Donald Trump in that way, right? Would the meeting have turned out the way that it was? When you talk about this point that it came so close to the edge. Yeah, look, I, I do think what Engel was able to at least penetrate Trump's brain of realizing that the optics of this would have been a disaster. Yeah. Everything that he was hoping to get would have, it would have worked the opposite way. It would have, you'd have had Senate Republicans walking away comp almost in unison, other than the, you know, the four to five that, that sort of are always willing to carry his water. And, and it would have, it would have probably uh, made things a whole heck of a lot worse for him. So the fact that he was self aware enough to listen to Mr. Engel. Uh, I think says something, and, and look, it may be the reason why he's never personally charged with a crime, hmm. right? Is that he caught, you know, as, as Lester and you and I were talking earlier, you know, uh, what did Danny call it? Buffers, right? Like uh, uh, the way the way uh, the lead heads of mobs are very careful. You know, it's sort of like they they have a whole bunch of other people doing the dirty work where they technically didn't commit any crimes here, or but he certainly went right up to the line. Uh, on that day to a line that even Richard Nixon wouldn't go to. Chuck Todd, uh, thank you. Appreciate your analysis. We'll do it all again, I guess, in a couple of weeks, Chuck, whenever yeah. we find out when the next hearing is. Appreciate it, friend. See you Sounds back in D.C. Bye now. Coming up here on the show, some really angry reaction, especially here in New York, where I am today, after a landmark Supreme Court decision today on guns. We'll tell you why it could mean more people with guns when they walk the streets of the city. That's coming up.